on I almost forgot to record on this one, right? So <laughs> they're they're teaching us, men are teaching us um, how to approach the Holy One of Israel and how we should study the what they call the Bible. You know, the Bible is is by definition is called the both the New Testament and the Old Testament. That's what they renamed it. Okay. But we are not talking about the Bible. We're talking about what they would call the Tanakh, which is the Torah. That's for the letter T. The N, which is the Navaim, which are the prophets, and the K. This is an acronym for the Torah, the Navaim, and the Ketavim. And the N is the for the prophets, which are called the Navaim, and the K is for the Ketavim which are the writings, which have to do with the Psalms, the Proverbs, Job, Esther, Ruth, you know, all those different writings. Um, but in general, we are not being directed the right way on how to search out Yah's words. Whether we know, understand this or we know this, the creator has given us the Hebrew language. And we if we don't study the Hebrew language and if we don't understand how it's being spoken and who's it being said to in terms of his verbs and his tenses, which are very important to understand um, the, the, the language and the culture that in which the Most High was talking to Israel in, he, didn't, he never spoke one word to them in English, not one word. Uh, I need you to hear what I just said. The creator has never spoken to Israel at all. Now, one time in English, he's only spoken to them in Hebrew, which they call Ivret. He, that's the language of that region. And as we've been studying, the language gives us insight on how and what Yah's talking about. Um, it's like a big puzzle. And if you don't understand how the puzzle works, you want to understand what Yah is saying. And I believe that he's done this this way in order to find out whether or not you and I are truly want to know who he is and some of the messages that he has for us. Okay. He's not going to tell us in English what it is. He'll use our, our minds, our subconsciouses to tell us different things. Um, but ultimately, English is not based upon culture. That's what I'm trying to get you to understand. You're a people of culture. You have to have a language, you have to have customs, you have to have ways in which you live so you can understand what the creator has said and, and how he said it and why he said it. So today we're going to dive into that. All right. So I just want to give you a little monologue on that to tell you what we're going to be talking about today. Um, let's just begin. I don't want to, I'm just going to let Yah tell us what he has said and express it to us and make sure that you, if you have any questions or concerns, feel free to lip, raise your hand on here and I'll be able to answer your questions, okay? So let's read it first in English, okay? And our tour portion this week is called Kukath, right? Which deals with um, a time of appointment at different times. And so what was uh, interesting about this Torah portion is we have some different words that were used in terms of um, the word kukath was used in, in a couple of different verses in different places in, in this portion, but it never really talked about appointed times. So, you know, festivals, right? So if, if, if a coke is a time and it's an appointed time in, in festival and it's, a, and it's a statue, then why isn't it not being used in that, in that way in this particular Torah portion? And what I found is, is that if you're dealing with, um, and let me show you what the word looks like right quick, okay? I'll go back to 2339 for a minute. Let's see, Coke. I know I'm a little slow today, but trust me, it's going to be... <laughs> Is gonna be worth the weight, uh, Coke. All right, Coke. All right, eleven eighty. Just 
just went past it. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. All right, cool. All right, here we go. All right, here we go. So in the Hebrew, it's the ket, it's the ket and it's the, the kof, okay? One is a, was, is a CH sound, which is the cat for a wall. And the other one is a, a qu, 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 in quality, a Q sound, okay? And those are the two letters that represent it right there, okay? So Coke means that the cat is a picture of a wall representing a separation, okay? That's what it means. It means separation. The, the, the Kof is a picture of the sun at the horizon, representing the idea of coming together, right? So when you combine these, it means separation and coming together. And generally a custom brings people who are separated together. So that's where we get our idea of appointed times. Our appointed times are, are statutes, okay? And so, but the action of this is to inscribe as if to write something or to put it in, you know, like when the Most High wrote the, the Torah, um, or excuse me, the covenant, the 10 words, he wrote them and he inscribed them, um, meaning that, hey, this is not going to ever be changed. But the abstract means a custom, the appointment of a, a specific time or a function or a duty, okay, as a custom of something that is appointed. The, uh, the part that I wanted to focus on for us is, is that in our Torah portion this week, it had absolutely nothing um, to do with... Um, what they would call an appointed time. We hear nothing about um, a festival. We hear nothing about, um, you know, any of the times that we come together like Shava Oath or Matzah or Sukkot. We don't hear anything about that. So the, the way that this word is functioning in our Torah portion is dealing with every time Yahweh brought them somewhere, okay? All right? He brought them there for a reason. This week, um, uh, Key Bess and I, we talk about the Torah, like I do with a lot of you, and we discovered that Yahweh, he would bring somebody, or he'll bring the children of Israel to different places, and when he brings them to their place, those places, it's for a reason, it's for a purpose, okay? Um, in this journey in which we call life, Yah brings us to different places at different times, so we can find out how he's trying to talk to us and what he's trying to say, okay? So let's just read right here, though. During these journeys, okay, in the desert, Starting in chapter, forgive me, guys, my neck is really bothering me. The people spoke against Yahweh and against Moshe. How many times have you guys heard this? How many times have we heard this Torah portion about the children of Israel speaking against the Elohim and Moshe? A lot. They've been speaking against them a lot. And this is what they said. Why did you bring us out of Mitzrayim? Why'd you bring us up out of Mitzrayim to die in the desert? Well, what's the backdrop on this? The backdrop is they just got rejected when Yah had sent them through over to Adam. He sent them to Edom to let them pass through. And Edom said, no, you can't pass through, right? Then he sent them somewhere else, right? And they had to walk all the way around, okay? Listen to this. Let's get the backdrop. The king of Arad of the Ka'anani who lived in the Gav heard that Israel was approaching by the way of Atarim and he attacked Israel and he took some of them captive. Israel made a vow to Yahweh, if you hand his people over to me, I will completely destroy their cities. Yahweh listened to what Israel has said and handed them over to the Ka'anin, right? So they completely destroyed them in their cities and named the place Hormah, which is, means complete destruction. Then they traveled from Mount Hor on the road to the, the Sea of Suf. OK, so remember this whole time they just got rejected from Adam. They went over to here and then they ended up going to battle and somebody kidnapped them and God took some prisoners and then they went to battle. Yah delivered them. But because they couldn't go directly through Edom, as, as Yah had brought them there for the reason of his purposes, they had to walk all the way around. Right. Instead of going the direction of going through, they had to walk all the way around. But the people's tempers grew short because of the detour. So what does this tell us about Israel? It tells us that they were very frustrated and they're angry about the road and the journey that Yah took them on. 
The wilderness is a place for Yah to talk to Israel. He could have easily took them uh, in another way. He brought them there to, to, number one, to deliver a message to the king of Adam. Then he brings them another direction so they can get in this battle to take their lands. Then he says, okay, now you got to take a detour. you got to go somewhere else. And that's the problem with us. We don't want to take the detours. We want to take the shortcuts. It would have saved them a lot of time to go through the place where they were. But Yah purposely sends us to different places and gives us detours in our life in order to bring us to the place where he wants to go so he can talk to us. The whole time that Yah had them in the wilderness is to be their shepherd. What did they do? Verse number five. The people spoke against Elohim and against Moshe. And this is what they said when they got frustrated. Why did you bring us out of Mitzrayim to die in the desert? There's no real food. There's no water. And we're sick of this miserable stuff we're eating. <laughs> what were they eating in the wilderness? What were they eating? The manna. They were eating the, the manna. That's what they were eating in the wilderness. But they just told Yah, why did you bring us out of Egypt? So we can die in here in the desert? There's no real food. There's no real food. There's no water. And we're sick of this miserable stuff we're eating. And in response, Yahweh sent poisonous snakes among the people. They bit the people and many of Israel's people died. Okay. They said it was poisonous. Okay. But they don't want to tell you that these, these snakes right here were fire. They were fire snakes. <laughs> they were, they were hot snakes. They were bronze. Okay. Okay. They came and they bit the people, and many of Israel's people died. They don't tell us how many, but a lot of Israel's people died. So in the wilderness, we've noticed and we're taking notice that these people are dying. They're dying. Praise God, Aki. They're dying. From what? From talking crazy. The people came to Moshe and said, we've sinned against Yahweh and against you. Pray to Yah to rid us of these snakes. Now, how many snakes do you think were out there? You think it was about 10 of them? And remember, there's over 1.5 to 2 million people out here. How many snakes? Tens of thousands. Tens of thousands of snakes. How would you guys like that? <laughs> okay. And look at the response. So Moshe prayed. And Yahweh answered Moshe, he says, make a poisonous snake and put it on a pole. And when you, when anyone who has been bitten sees it, he will live. So Moshe made a bronze snake and he put it on the pole. And the snake, had, if, if a snake had bitten someone, then when they looked toward the bronze snake, they stayed alive. Okay. So the verses that we're going to break down today, and, and that's the English version. That's the very vanilla version of what was spoken so it just seems like a very easy story to understand right they they said some stuff they got bit by some snakes and 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 then they and then they were looking to be healed it looks easy doesn't it and that's and, and what what do you guys got gathered from that so far before we go into the lesson <laughs> No takers. Okay. Well, let's get into the lesson. Okay. It says, and spoke. Okay. And it's a third person masculine singular. Okay. And he spoke the people. Okay. So when it talks about the people and they have the people as a masculine singular. Okay. He spoke in Hebrew. It says, why the bear? The yod in that is called he spoke. Third person masculine singular, only one. So it's talking about one person, but it says the people. So what is that telling us? What does that tell us about Israel? It tells us that when when he, the people. Yah looks at Israel as one man. 
So when they spoke, they spoke as one man to Yah. When Israel speaks to Yah as a community, they're going to be judged as one person. Remember, he says, I could wipe everybody out as if they're one person. You see, when Yah talks about Israel singular, he talks about Jacob being one, right? So when Yah is looking at Israel, he's looking at one person. He's looking at one man. Okay, that's why he says, when I come and get you, I'm going to come get all of you. I'm not going to get some of you. I'm going to get all of you. Right. So what it is, is that these individuals, they spoke against Yah. Okay. Um, is, and, the, and he heard them. Okay. And he says, and they spoke against Moshe, both of them. And he asked a question, which is an interrogative, meaning why? So they're, they're asking this question. Why have you brought us up out of Mitzrayim? to die in the wilderness. This is a statement, okay? They're asking this question. Why did you bring us out of Mitzrayim so we can die in this wilderness? Is that why you brought us here? They're trying to figure out why Yah brought them there because their whole journeys and their travelings are all over the place. They're going from one location to the next. Remember, they had already been disinherited. So the people are already, are already upset. They're already perturbed because they don't have an inheritance. Where he said, you're not going in the land. That happened in chapter number 14. We're in chapter number 21, seven chapters later. They're still not going in the land. And, and they know that. And they're just traveling. He said, why are you brought us out here to die? In the Bar Midbar. He says, for not the bread. And there's no, no food, no lechem. There's no bread and there's no water. You guys remember why Yah brought the children of Israel out to the wilderness? Why did he bring them out there? Why did he why did he make sure that they didn't have any food and no water? Because they, they wouldn't fight the uh they, they they did not think that they could take the land, the first land that he showed them. Well, remember in the book of Deuteronomy chapter number eight, it says that they were in the, he says, you remember everything in the way in which Yahweh led you these 40 years in the desert. He was humbling you and testing you in order to know what was in your heart, whether you would obey his commandments or not. He humbled you and he tested you to see if you would obey his commandments. This is what the wilderness experience is all about. To find out whether or not you will obey what I said or not. Yah has to put us in a position to find out whether or not you and I are going to do what he says. And the way that he does it is through food. I know you've never heard that before, but it's the truth. And I'm going to show it to you today. He allows you, in verse number eight, on um, three of chapter number eight of Deuteronomy, he humbled you, allowing you to become hungry. He became, let them hungry. And I and he fed you with manna. So the food that they're asking, what we don't have any food, no water, and this bread that we have is detestable to us. You see? This is what they were saying. So going back, juices are flowing now. I'm ready to go. They're saying that our soul, our very being, who we are, right here, our soul, our, our nafshu, okay? Nafshe, nafshe Our nafshe nu, nafash or nafesh is your soul, and nu means us. Our and our soul, our souls, plural, loaves, okay? Katza, we loathe and hate and feel loathing and abhorrence, and we're sickened to dread. We This is an abhorrence to us. We dread this. It's kind of like going to a job that you don't want to go to. <laughs> it's like, it's like, uh, it's like uh, eating, um, <laughs> eating uh, oatmeal every day. <laughs> for 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 every day for for uh, a year <laughs> you see i want you to get it let's let's stop being religious let's just keep it real let's just 100 
they they said they hate, they loathe, they loathe Yah's bread. They loathe. It's an abhorrence to them. They're like every morning, like, you know, man, but they really say man, they say D-A-M-E. Man, not again, over and over and over again. <laughs> And then they said that his bread was not only did they loathe it, but they said that it was worthless. <laughs> they said Yah's bread was. That's what they said. They said that. Okay. Why did they say it? Why, why, why? I didn't get why did they say that? Somebody tell me. Why did they say the, the bread that Yah was giving them, which is the manna, why was it? It, 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 they detested it and it was worthless to them. It meant nothing to them. Uh, because uh, they were used to having cucumbers, watermelons, and things like that. And also it dried them out. So, so they said. Right. So, what, yeah. So, go, that's a good point, Aki. When you go back and they're talking about going to Egypt, why'd you? So, it's always asked you, why'd you bring us out of Egypt? See, they said it's contemptible, it's worthless. Why? So Egypt to them was a place where they were able to get what they want and do what they want, just like here. Okay, they they thought what Yah has said his bread was was lo uh, loathsome and it was trifling, it was swift, it was nothing to them, absolutely nothing. And that was what they were living off of the whole time that they were out in the wilderness. That's what Yah fed them until the day they went into the land that Yah promised them was manna. Okay, you guys with me? I want you to follow what I'm saying because we're going to go somewhere with this. Okay, so let's go look at Exodus chapter number 16 and find out why God gave them this bread. <laughs> okay, so go to Exodus chapter number 16 and you're going to find out why God gave them this bread. Okay, because everything is always a test. It's not for any other reason. It's not to see how religious we are. It's only to find out whether or not you and I are going to do what he says. Okay. Again, in Exodus, we have that they traveled. So again, you see them traveling from one place to the next. You know, when you travel, you get hungry, right? And you're walking and your body starts getting weak. And, and you know, so you need sustenance in order to get you from one point to the next. But Yah was not giving them food sometime. And he was having them travel without food, right? And then he says, the whole community of people of Israel arrived at Sin Desert. Okay, between Elam and Sinai. And on the 15th day of the second month after leaving the land of Egypt. Okay, so literally there's 30 days after they left Egypt. They're walking. <laughs> they're not on a car. They're not on a bicycle. They're not on camels. They are walking. Okay, they're in the desert. The whole community of people of Israel grumbled against Moshe and Aaron. And the people of Israel said to them, we wish Yahweh would have used his own hand to kill us off in Egypt. <laughs> 30 days later, 30 days, they said, we wish that he would kill us. This is the mindset of, of the people of Israel. Do you guys get this? He, he just delivered them from slavery, but they're still not satisfied. We wish that you would just have killed us in Egypt because they were hungry. They wanted bread. Look at, like you said, Forrest, you said, there we used to sit around. The pots with meat boiling. <laughs> they had a stews going on. They had all kind of, you know, lamb uh, lamb bowls and you know mixed with curry, and they had all kind of stuff. They had to, the the um, the non bread, you know, the flat breads. And he said, "We eat as much food as we wanted." Thirty days after they left, but you have taken us out into this desert, this whole assembly to starve to death. Was this a true statement? Was it true? Did y'all bring him out to the desert to starve him? <laughs> no. Uh, uh, he, didn't, he didn't bring him out there to starve him, but he brought him out there to make him hungry. <laughs> what they did here is they, they what they call, they put, they, put, um, they put too much on it. You know how we say, oh, they put too, you putting too much on it? They put too much on this. They were hungry, but they and but they uh, ex accentuated or 
um, they blew, blew it out of proportion and said, you starved us. You're starving us. You're starving us because you're not giving us what we want. You're starving us. I'm hungry. I'm st you know how people say I'm starving to death? This is where they get it from. They weren't starving. They were hungry. You understand? Follow me on this because we're smart people. Only smart people want to learn. That's just the bottom line. The reason why people don't want to learn is because they're dumb. And Yah says they're stupid. And I'll, I don't have time to go to it, but I'll tell you. is in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 22, or Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 22, 23. My people are stupid, and they perish for lack of knowledge. So stay with me. Yahweh said to Moshe, here, I will cause bread to rain down from heaven for you. The people are to go out and gather a day's ration every day. So how often is Yahweh going to give this bread? Based on what we just read. Daily. Class participation. Huh? Daily, except Friday. Daily. Day by day. Okay? So when you go get, and what is he going to give the people? He's going to give them a day's ration every single day. You're going to go out and get a ration every day. By this, I will what? I will test. We're in Exodus chapter 16, verse 4. I will test whether they will observe my Torah. My Torah is my instructions. Or not. This is a key element for Israel to understand. Yah, use your stomach to find out whether or not you're going to do what he says. So this is the test. The test is giving them a day's ration every single day. I, I'll say it, you finish it. Man shall not live by. Bread alone. Bread alone, but by. Every word. On the sixth day, they will prepare what they brought in. It will turn out to be twice as much as they gathered on other days. So you do your gathering in the day. So again, the Shabbat is on the daytime. The Shabbat is not at night. Okay? You will go out and gather a day's portion. <laughs> when is the day? The day is when you see sunlight. You don't believe me, go to Psalms 104, and you will find that all mankind does their work during the day. And at night, they go to, they rest, okay? So here on the sixth day, when the sun is out, they're going to go out and gather. You don't gather stuff at night. Moshe and Aharon said to all the people this evening, you will realize Okay, in this evening, in a rev, when the sun starts going down, you will realize it is that it has been Yahweh who brought you out of Mitzrayim. Why is this a question? Because the children of Israel did not believe that Yahweh brought them out of Mitzrayim. Okay, he says, in the morning, you will see Yahweh's glory. Okay, for he has listened to your grumblings against Yahweh. He's heard what you said. That's what we need to understand. If Yah hears us, then we need to understand that when we speak, he listens to us. And if he listens, listens to us, then in order to have a relationship with him, he will listen to you. If you would listen to him. It goes both ways. What are They asked the question, what are we, talking about Moshe and Aharon, that you grumble against us? We're nobody. Moshe added, what have I said? What I have said will happen when Yahweh gives you meat this evening. So again, you see a difference between evening and bread in tomorrow morning. Associating it with what? Associating the morrow with the day. Okay? Tomorrow morning. Okay? And Yahweh has listened. He's heard your complaints against him and your grumblings against him. What are we? So your grumblings are not against us, but against Yahweh. When you and I have complaints, it's really not against the people, especially those in leadership. If someone's telling you something and you start talking about bad about the person, it's not you're talking about them, you're talking about Yah. If Yah's directing you, if, if, if you're a child and the Most High is um, uh, instructing you through your parents, 
You're saying I, you know, I'm mad at my parents. You're cursing your parents. No, you're not. You're talking about Yah. You understand? So Moshe and Aharon said to the whole community, come close into the presence of Yahweh. He has heard your grumblings. Aharon spoke to the whole community, the people of Israel, and they looked toward the desert. And there before them, the glory of Yahweh appeared in a cloud. And Yahweh said to Moshe, I have heard the grumblings of the people of Israel. Say to them, at dusk, you will be eating meat. At dusk, meaning a rev, when the light goes out. And then you will be, in the morning, you will have your fill of bread. Then you will realize that I am Yahweh, your Elohim. Okay? So what am I trying to get us to understand about this without going deep, you know, continuing through this whole passage? Is the fact that Yah has given us manna. Okay? The, and our manna is, is different from, from their manna. And I will say this to you. Yah's words that he speaks is manna. Okay, he was using the flaky substance to frail down from heaven as a representative of that which he is going to say. Because Yah would speak it and it would come to pass, it would fall every single day because Yah said for it to come down. The correlation between that manna and where we're at right now, Yah has given us the manna of his words. And you and I are supposed to read the Torah every single day. If you don't read your Torah portion, it's because you're not going out and gathering the words of the living Elohim. He told you and I specifically that man should not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of Elohim. These words that he's giving us are from from Yah's mouth directly to Moshe's ears. He spoke to him directly. He did not speak to anyone else this way. He spoke to Moshe. The reason why the people didn't understand is because it's something that they never understood. They've never seen it before. He says, your ancestors don't even know what this bread is. Question. When I'm reading the Hebrew scriptures to you, and I'm bringing it to you, and I ask, and you say, what is it? What is this language you're talking about? What is this culture that you're talking about? Yah is giving us something he's not even giving to our ancestors. Do you understand what I just told you? Your mother, your father, your grandfather, and all them never received the words of the living Elohim. Not these words. They receive words that are in English, translations that people that don't understand our culture or our custom has fed to us over hundreds of years. And we've been eating it and eating it and eating it and eating it. And we've been dying and dying and dying and dying and nothing in our life has changed. Because what we're eating doesn't have any substance to it. We don't, we gather it on Sunday when they told us, or we gathered on Easter when they told us this is about resurrection, or we gathered on Christmas on the birth of some so-called baby of God, some Greek mythology. The words of the living Elohim are the words that came in his language. Verse number 15, if Exodus chapter 16, when the people of Israel saw it, they asked each other, man who? That's why it's called mana, because it's man who? What is it? That is not on an accident. It's a question. It is a question they ask. So if the bread that they ate was a question, that's what they ate. They didn't know what it was. When they picked, they did not understand what it meant. Listen what it says. I'll read it again. Verse number 15. When the people of Israel saw it, they asked each other, Manhu, what is it? Because they didn't know what it was. Moshe answered them, it is the bread, the lakim, in which Yahweh Elohim has given you to eat. Here is what Yahweh has ordered. Yahweh has ordered each man is to gather it according to his appetite. Each is to take an omer or two quarts per person, every one in his tent. The people of Israel did this. Some gathers more and some gathered less. 
But when they put it in the Omer measure, what, whoever had gathered much had no access. They didn't have any excess. It wasn't to be, it was not supposed to be meant to be spoiled or ruined or use more than you didn't need, whatever you needed, that's what you got, okay? And whoever gathered little had no shortage. They got exactly what they needed. Nevertheless, each person gathered according to his appetite. Let's stop there. A lot of us, I, when I talk about this class that you guys are on, and I'm, I'm saying, hey, listen, you know, we need to learn the Hebrew, okay? And this is what, listen, gather what you need to gather of what Yah's giving you. Gather. You don't have to eat as much as I'm eating. You don't have to eat as much as I keep best. You don't have to eat as, as, as less as uh, uh, Koti uh, Aviyah. You don't have to. It's what is, is applicable for you and your appetite. When we're following the Holy One of Israel, we have to get what's going to sustain us. Some people only need a little bit. Some people only interested in a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of wisdom. And that's fine. Yeah, it's not calling everybody to be leaders. There always are going to be leaders, and there's always going to be people who are not in that capacity. There's always going to be a master and a servant. There's always going to be um, someone who's in charge. We got to fit in the roles that we've been put in. Moshe told them no one is to leave any of it into the morning. But they didn't pay attention. Verse 20, they didn't pay attention and some kept the leftovers until the morning. Why? Why did not they not pay attention? Because Yah's people don't listen. They didn't pay attention to Moshe. Why should we listen to Moshe? Because Yah told us to remember Moshe. Why should we listen to Moshe? Because he's the only one that Yah spoke face to face to. He's the only one that Yah revealed the Torah too. Every king throughout Israel says the same thing. We did this in accordance to the Torah of Moshe. Yah didn't say the Torah of Jeremiah, the Torah of Yeshayahu, the Torah of Nehemiah. He said the Torah of Moshe. There is no greater prophet than the prophet of Moshe. Deuteronomy chapter number 34 says there has never arisen any other prophet greater than Moshe. Remember the Torah of Moshe because Moshe went to Yah on our behalf to receive the information to prepare us. So when we hear what Yah is saying, we can hear it through the man that we chose. Where is that? You, you're saying we chose it? Yes, we chose it. We chose Moshe. We chose Moshe. Exodus chapter number 20 says this. This is where all the, the 10 words are. Yah tells us exactly how to do everything, right? Verse number 18. All the people, all the people experienced the thunder of the lightning, the sound of the shofar, the mountain smoking. When the people saw it, talking about when they were on Mount Sinai, they trembled, standing at a distance. Why were they trembling? Because they saw the fire of Yah coming down from the heavens down to Mount Sinai. It wasn't a campfire. It was a fire that went up thousands of feet into the midst of the heavens. Thunder, lightning, the sound of the shofar. These people were scared to death. And they said, listen what they said, standing at a distance. They said to Moshe, you speak with us. We will listen. You, Moshe, you speak with us and we will listen. But don't let Elohim speak with us or we'll die. Moshe answered the people, don't be afraid. Because Elohim has come to what? To test you. To test you and make you fear him so that you won't commit sins. Is he talking about the sin in your body? 
No, he's talking about deliberate sin, not in inadvertent sin. Not sins that are made by mistake or accident or just by sheer nature of being a human being. So the people stood at a distance, but Moshe approached the thickness where Elohim was. Moshe approached. That's who approached Yahweh. Because we asked him to. That's why Yah wants us to remember Moshe, the Torah of Moshe, because you guys are the ones who asked for Moshe to be your prophet. You're the one who asked him to go on your behalf. You're the one who didn't want to hear anything I had to say. After you heard the 10 words that I told you, you said, I don't want to hear it no more. So I told you to go back to the tent and you said, Moshe, you go for us and you go hear what God says. And then after you receive it, you come and tell us and we'll do everything you said. Let me introduce you to what Yah is talking to the children of Israel about in the book of De Deuteronomy, Davaram, chapter number 18, verse number nine. This is a big deal about who is this prophet? Who is the, pro the prophet? Yah is not talking about the prophet. He's talking about a prophet, which could be any prophet. Well, why? Why, why, why? Why would Yah send a prophet to Israel? Let's find out. He says, when you enter the land of Yahweh Elohim is giving you. This is Moshe talking. Because remember, they didn't want to hear Yahweh. They wanted Moshe to talk to them. When you enter the land Yahweh is giving you, you are not to learn. You're not to learn. L-E-A-R-N. Learn. You are not to learn how to follow the abominable practices of those nations. Let's stop right there for a quick second. You and I need to understand that when we go to other nations, we have to be careful not to learn anything from them. Nothing. How they live, how they eat, how they talk, how they reason, how they communicate. What do they do? What are their habits? Yah says, when you go into this, my land, you can't be like that. But here's the thing. I'm about to show you something. OK, he says, there must not be found among you anyone who makes his son and daughter to pass through the fire. No fire. You're not going through the fire. You're not doing that abominable practice because that's what those people were doing. Not a diviner, no diviners. I don't want any diviners. I, you shall not be a soothsayer. A sayer. You should not be an enchanter doing witchcraft, a sorcerer, magic, a spellcaster, a consulter of ghosts or spirits. So this idea about the Holy Ghost and I felt the spirit of God come upon me and it fell on me and I started speaking in tongues and such and such and such and such. It's not true. Or a necromancer, someone who deals with the people of the dead, talk to the dead. Or even for that matter, someone who rose from the dead. Verse number 12, for when whoever does these things is detestable to Yahweh, they are detestable. They're an abomination to him because these abominations, Yahweh is driving them out ahead of you. You must be wholehearted with Yah. What is he talking about? You got to be wholehearted with him. Why is he mentioning wholeheartedness with him? Because if you and I are going to anybody else to go get an answer, because he's saying when you get to these nations and you go into these nations, don't do what the people do. The people go to diviners. They go to tarot call readers. They go to um, people who can tell their future. They go to fortune tellers. They go to whoever they need to go to to get an answer from Yah or from them. He says, you don't want to go and do this because that's not being wholehearted towards me. But I'm going to tell you what you should do. Verse 14, for these nations which you're about to dispossess, they listen to soothsayers and diviners. I want you to remember the word diviner. I want you to remember this word in our study today, diviners and soothsayers. Communication with Yah. 
but Yahweh, your Elohim, does not allow you to do this. You and I are not allowed to talk to anybody to go get an answer about nothing. Nothing at all. If you and I want an answer from Yah, he's going to tell you how to do it and where you'll find your answer. Yahweh will raise up, verse number 15. For those of you who want to think it's the prophet, it's a prophet. Yahweh will raise up for you a prophet like me from among yourselves. Okay? He's going to be like me. And in what way is he going to be like me? How is he going to be like me? Well, he's going to be like me in several ways. Okay? And he's going to tell us how he's going to be like Moshe. Is he going to be 80 years old? Is he going to have a staff in his hand? How what is his, his characteristics? Is he going to look like him? What are we talking about here? What we're talking about is he says he will be from your own relatives, your own kinsmen. Did he say which relatives are you from? Did he say some specific tribe? Or did he say he's going to be like me? He's going to be one of your family members. He's going to be from among your brothers, your kinsmen. He didn't give any specific tribe. He said a kinsman, a relative, you are to pay attention to him like you pay attention to me. Just as when you were assembled, here's the kicker. This is the understanding that a lot of people don't understand. Verse number 16, he says, just as when you were assembled at Korev. Korev has another name called Mount Sinai and you requested and requested, you assembled and you requested, Yahweh, your Elohim, don't let me hear the voice of Yahweh, my Elohim, anymore. We don't want to hear his voice anymore. Or let me see this great fire ever again. Or if, if I do, I will die. Talking about I individually? No, talking about the nation. Because the nations of the leaders went to Moshe and said, we don't want to hear it. We don't want to hear this voice no more. We're going to die. So we'll listen to you. We're going to listen to what you say. Do you now, you know why Yah says, remember the Torah of Moshe? Because Moshe is writing down Yah's voice. The next prophet that comes along is going to be like Moshe. How many prophets do we have? We have Isaiah. We got Nehemiah. We got Jeremiah, we got Zephaniah, we got Yoel, we got Yonah, we got a whole bunch of men, uh, Kagai, uh, Obadiah, all of them. They were of the family of Israel, and they came, and they told them what Yahweh has said. They're telling what Yah said. On that occasion, when you decided that you didn't want to listen to Yah, but you wanted me to go on your behalf, on that occasion, Yahweh said to me, hey, they're right in what they're saying. They're right because I will kill them. Because no man can be in my presence and, meet and see me face to face. I'm going to kill them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to raise up a prophet for them. This is what Yah says. I'm going to raise up a prophet, a prophet, not the prophet. The reason why we have a problem is because we don't understand between a and the, which this is in our Hebrew. We need to understand in Hebrew, they have what you call a definite article. Let me make it clear to you. I got, I got five books on the table and I say, go give me the book. Go give me that book or go give me, go give me a book. You ask me what book? And I would say the book, not a book. I didn't ask you for a book. I asked you for the book. So what I would do is I would have to describe that book to you so you would understand which one I'm talking about. But here, there is no definite article. There is no the prophet. It's only a prophet. So this can mean any prophet. Do you understand? So I'm going to put my words in his mouth. I'm going to, I'm going to raise him up from among your relatives. In verse number 18, I'm going to put my words in his mouth. Did he put his, his words in the mouth of, of Hezekiah? I mean, excuse me, Ezekiel? Yes. Yahweh came up to me and said, tell them this is what Yahweh says. Did his words come into the book of Jeremiah? This is what Yahweh says. Now, I want somebody, please somebody tell me in the New Testament where Yah spoke to anybody. Whoever said, thus saith Yahweh. Did even Christ, did he even say it? 
Did he ever say, hey, this is Yah, this is Yah's name. This is the word of Yah who came into me. No. Not one time has Yah ever spoken in that book. Not one time is his name even mentioned in that book. Go look at it for yourselves. 6,828 times his name, Yohei is written in the Tanakh. Over 500 times in the book of Deuteronomy, not one time is his name ever invoked in the New Testament. Not one time did Paul say, this is what Yahweh says. So those people over there in the New Testament are not Yah's people. They were not sent by Yah. Let's finish up because you thought it was about the prophet. It's a, about a prophet. He says, I will put my words in his mouth. And he will tell them everything I ordered him. So when you're reading Paul, uh, Timothy, Lucas, Timotheus, Titus, and Marcus, and all of the Barabbas, you read them, you ask yourself, did they say anything that Yah said? Nothing. Whoever doesn't listen to my words, he will speak in my name. There is your ingredient. I'll read it. I'll calm down because I get fired up when I think about it. Whoever doesn't listen to my words, he speaks or speak in my name, will have to give an account himself to me. So did they ever speak in his name? Not one time. Not one time. Question. When Yeshua, okay, there, there was, I, I'm just, I'm going to take a little detour right here, okay? When Yeshua said, um, I've come in your name and I made your name known to them and everything I do is in your name. Well, wh why did he never mention his name? Why has he never mentioned Yah's name? Not one time. Not one time did he ever mention Yah's name. Go look at it for yourselves. Okay. But if a prophet, now we're still on a prophet, verse 20. But if a prophet, so now the whole context of this is talking about a prophet, someone who's going to speak on Yah's behalf. But if a prophet presumptuously speaks a word in my name, which I did not order him to say, or if he speaks in the name of other gods, then that prophet must die. You may be wondering, verse 21, Moshe tells us, you may be wondering, how are we to know if the word has not been spoken by Yahweh? How are we going to know whether or not this guy has actually been sent and spoke by Yah? How do we know this? When a prophet speaks in the name of Yahweh, the prediction does not, and the prediction does not come true. Th that is, the word is not fulfilled then Yahweh did not speak that word. That is the prerequisite. If the prediction doesn't come true, then Yah didn't speak that word. It's not fulfilled. Yahweh didn't speak that word. The prophet who said, spoken presumptuously, you have nothing to fear because it never came true. He's saying, don't listen to anybody. So what's the proof about if Moshe is a prophet from Yah? Everything that he said came true. Everything that he said came true. True for the curses that happened to Israel. True for what they're gonna, what's going to happen to them, putting exile out of the land. So if the exile and the curses are true, then we also know that the redemption of Israel is also true. Did he also, so were the words that he spoke to us about the diet true? Yes. Were the words true about how we should keep the Shabbat? Yes. It's all true. When Isaiah spoke to the children of Israel, more specifically the, the kingdom of Judah, and he told them what was going to happen to them, did it come past? Yes. When he spoke to them about a son being born and child given, did that happen? Yes, it happened then. His children were signs. Did the army, was there an uh, Ephraimitic and Assyrian war that, that happened, and they tried to invade Judah? Did that happen in chapter number uh, 7, 8, 9 of Isaiah? Yes. It happened. So everything Yah speaks has to come to pass. Do you understand? Why am I going here? I'm going here to let you know that when Yah speaks, he's speaking to us through his words, his voice. And the only one who has the access to Yah is Moshe. He's the only one. 
So when we look at what the children of Israel said, going back to Numbers chapter number 21, verse 5, we find that they said that the words and the, 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 the manner that was given to them was worthless. It was worthless. They didn't have any care about what Yah said. Okay. So in essence, they didn't care anything about what the prophet says, because that's how Yah is going to communicate with Israel. Now, verse number six, it says, and sent Yahweh among the people, the serpents, and they're called the, uh, the Hanakashim. Okay. He sent serpents and there were thousands of them. Okay. Probably thousands. Okay. Tens of thousands, because there was millions of people out there. Okay. Everybody was getting bit. Okay. And Nakash is a serpent, right? Nakash is a serpent. And I want to be clear to you that a lot of times we call uh, the serpent uh, the devil. Yah has never called Nakash the devil. Never. Yah has never called Nakash the devil. Okay. Where was the serpent? Where was the serpent first mentioned? Where was Nakash first mentioned? What is a Nakash? A Nakash is a serpent. But there's something different about these serpents. These serpents are called Sarafims. They're called Hasafarims. And Safarims are seraphs, right? And in the vision that Isaiah had about these um, heavenly beings were called Sarafims. And they were fiery ones. They were like fiery, fiery beings. Okay, they're called Sarafims. So when Yah sent these Sarafims, these snakes were burning. They had a they had a burning effect of their poison, and they were they were literally biting the people and burning them and biting them. And more than likely, uh, they were biting them where? Where were they biting them? Somebody tell me where was the snake bite you? In the heel. Where's the snake? He'll bite you on the heel. He'll bite you on the ankle. Okay, and then the people died. And a lot of people died. Rav, um, sorry, I'm from Israel. A lot of people died. Verse number seven. And it, and therefore it came. And the people went to Moshe, and they said, "We have sinned, and has spoken to against Yahweh and against you. So we're asking for you to pray for us. We need some intercession. We need for you to intercede for us. Okay. Thank you. On the feet, yes. On your heel, he's going to bite you on the heel. And so, um, to, and they asked and asked Yah to. Moshe to intercede on their behalf so he could take away and to turn. Listen to me. Turn. Listen, listen to this word. It's called why yaser. Right here. They asked Yah to turn the serpents away from them. Okay. Meaning to get them to go in a different direction. Okay. That's what that word yasar is. Okay. So I need you, I need you to remember that. They asked Yah to turn the serpents away from them, to take them away. It's not just take, it's to turn. To turn them away. If you look at that word Yasar in Hebrew, uh, 50, uh, 5493 in the Strong's, but you look at it, let's pull it up right quick. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speed up the teaching because I got a lot more to talk about. And I don't want to keep you past your time today. I want to honor your Shabbat today and let you have the rest that you're looking for. Okay. So this thing is tripping now. Now it wants to, now it wants to, there you go. Okay, sure. It means to turn aside. Okay, that's what it means. Ask Yah to turn aside, to turn these serpents away from us. Um, turn them from us, these serpents, these, these Hanakash. And then he prayed for it, he interceded. And so what it was, a person who intercedes for someone, I just want to give you a little idea about the um, Palel. Palel in Hebrew means to intercede. Asking Yah to make, to make a decision. Not, not so you could just take away whatever their situation is. Okay, so when you're interceding for someone, you're you're asking Yah to decide. You're helping Yah make a decision on that person's behalf. So if I want to intercede for you in prayer, I would have to understand your situation. Okay, so be careful about asking someone to pray for you, and if they don't know your situation, because if they're praying for you and they don't know your situation, they're wasting their time. You understand what I just said? If someone is saying, I'll pray for you, but they really don't know your situation, they shouldn't be the one to intercede for you. They have to literally have to empathize and understand what you're going through in order to go to Yah. Because when you talk about Palel, okay, and this is a good Hebrew word to understand, just to give you some understanding about Palel, um, he asked him to cause himself to uh, Palel. Palel means to make, be decisive. Okay, so I want to show it to you. But of course, your computer's like heck of slow. Okay, so it's to intervene 
okay, to interpose, okay? It means they got prayer, but they're asking Yah to give them some judgment, okay? I need you to make a favorable judgment on their behalf. I need you, I'm coming to you um, before or before the end of a judgment. I'm asking you to, I'm coming before it comes to its end. Because if he didn't go and interpose for them or he didn't go intercede for them or he didn't go mediate for them, okay? Um, it would have gone on. It would have continued. But sometimes if you could get to Yah during a time of judgment, you know, and perhaps he may be merciful. Moshe wasn't saying, I need, I, I go ahead and turn this away from me. He didn't say that. He went to Yah to ask Yah to make a decision before the end of their judgment. A lot more people would have died, but he went and he mediated for them on their behalf. And so the person that they spoke against, they said, we sinned against you and we sinned against Yah. And so if you could see right here that the Most High is using the very person that they sinned against too. So if a person sins against you and they come to you and they say, hey, you know, what? and everything in my life is going bad because I've done something wrong. I want you to go to Yah on my behalf. And I'll say, I'll just say this um, honestly and openly. I have people in, in my family, not my immediate family, my extended family, my, you know, brothers and sisters and cousins and all these people. I have people in my family who have done me wrong. And if they ever came to me and said, hey, you know what? I'm going through a lot. Could you pray to Yah for me? That's my job to do that. And that's because we're supposed to be like Moshe in terms of being humble, okay? So if someone does something against you and they sin against you, you and I have to be like Moshe and go pray for them, okay? That's what Yah is asking us to do as well. Um, number eight says, and why you And he said, Yahweh to Moshe, he says, make to you a serpent, okay? Make a seraph, make a fiery serpent and, and set it and set this serpent on a pole okay so what i want to show you right quick is what this word pole means because a lot of times we just read and say oh that's just a regular pole he took a, a, a bronze serpent he made it he shaped it and he put it on a pole so what does it mean what does this pole mean okay it's called a nace okay so when we look at a nace in hebrew it's called a nace okay it's a noon and a samak it's called a nace and a nace is called a standard like where you put a, a flag on like if you're in the military back in the day and you had an army, you would have a flag and you're on your flag, you'd have your, your symbol. Like Judah would have a, a lion and Benjamin would have a wolf and, you know, Don would have a snake. And so all these images you would have uh, as a standard to lift up high, to lift it up high. So that's what it means. It's called a nace, right? And it's, it's as a sign and it's as a signal. So this in particular um, thing that Yah told Moshe to do was a sign, okay? I need you to make as a signal to them to make it obvious and conspicuous to them because once you look at it, they were supposed to what find healing in it. But this word comes from nasas, and we're gonna look at nasas, and again, it means to be high and conspicuous where you can see it. But I want to go a little bit further. And actually, the deepest Hebrew root of it is called nas nasas, right? And nasas means to be sick. This is what the the beauty of the Hebrew language is in the culture. So. When Yah asked for it to be put on a, the snake to be put on a pole, he was saying because the people were sick. The people were sick. They were not just dying like instantly. There wasn't like you got bit and you died. It was poison and, and, and it killed them. And it was, it was literally a death. It was like a, a uh, they probably died. I, I don't want to, a whole bunch of conjecture, but it takes time for us, for you to die from a snake bite. And it, it could be very painful. And in this case, these, these were very painful. But this word nasas comes from the word to be, or the meaning to be sick. That's why he told them to put the snake on a pole because it had to do with the illness that they had, okay? Let me also share with you um, uh, another thing. Let me see right here. Oh, go ahead, Akika. Akika, you raise your hand. It's like, Question? And it's like you were saying last night, uh, uh, the medical to this day, uh, medical, the nace to use are the snakes for the, for the medical. Yes, for, I'm about to pull it. Yes, okay. yes, I'm pulling up as we speak. So praise the Holy One of Israel. Um, so you can see, um, you can see from the symbol for medicine. 
the symbol for medicine is I'm about to show it to you right quick. Okay, here you guys got it. You guys see this? Those of you who can't see it on Facebook, I want you to go for and go look at the medical symbol, uh, the symbol for medicine. Go look at the, the symbol for medicine. And what you're gonna have is a pole and you have two snakes. Some of them have two snakes going around, right? And they got wings on it. Why do they have wings? And why are there snakes? Because they get it from the Torah. Look at it right here. You see this? It's a pole with a snake on it. Look at the symbol for medicine. Okay? And I'm about to blow your mind. Okay? You guys see that? Let me show you something now. Now that we saw that, Yah told him to take the brass serpent and put it on a stick. And that what it is is a picture of medicine, right? That's how he's supposed to get their healing, right? Okay. So, and he says, everyone who is bitten, and when he looks at it, and this look right here, that hey, he used to look upon it, and he shall live, okay? And Moshe made the serpent out of bronze, or the nakasheth, right? Out of bronze, and he put it on the pole. He put it on the hanes, okay? And on the hanes, if anyone was bitten by this snake, anyone who they looked at it, they were healed. You understand? They, were, they lived. They lived. So this is where you get the idea where Christ says, I'm high and lifted up, and anybody that looks upon me, I'm going to be healed. This is where they get it from. Does anyone have any questions before I go on? I just want to show you something, okay? All right, is everyone clear about the pole, the snake, and Yah, um, Yah told him anybody who was bitten by it gets to live, okay? They get to live. And what is life? What is life? Breath. Huh? Breath. Life is called a kaya. Okay? Kaya. C-H-A-Y-A-H. Kaya. Kaya. Got it? You see that? Kaya. That's what life is, okay? But what is life from a Hebraic standpoint? What is life? Does anybody remember? My wife wears the symbol of the Kai and my daughters wear it. What does it mean? The Ket and the Yo represent something. And it represents life. Here you go. Eleven seventy one. Where does it say? Kai, your life. Your life is your stomach in Hebrew. Your life is not, you know, your television programs and your um, basketball NBA games. Your life is not your car. Your life is not your job. Your life is not, um, uh, you know, what they would told us in the Western culture, what your life is. Your life is your stomach. And that's the first thing to go when you die. You, you lose your appetite. Um, and then when there's no food in it and it's empty and you're famished, then you won't live, okay? So your life is your stomach. And when the stomach is empty, one is famished and they're weak, okay? W-E-A-K. And when it is filled, your one is revived. This organ is seen as life and as an empty stomach is like to death. So a full stomach is revived. A revived stomach is life. So let me make it very clear to you, Israel. When Israel was traveling with Yah, they were what? They were hungry. Their stomachs were empty. So that's why they always felt like they were going to die. They were like, did you bring us out here so we can die? Did you guys see that? 
So the, so the Kai, your Kai, your life is your stomach, okay? The Most High is, is showing us something here in Numbers chapter 21, verse 5, to tell us when the children of Israel got bit by these serpents, they got a pole, they put, with the, they put the, the brass serpent on it, and that's a medical symbol to have life. Life means to be healed, okay? So obviously, these people were getting sick, and they were dying, okay? Where's the first place that a, a Nakash, a serpent, is mentioned? Where's the first place? Somebody tell me, what's the first place that a Nakash is ever mentioned in the in the Torah? Bereshit with uh, uh, Adam, I believe. Any? Bereshit, yes, it's Bereshit, it's chapter number three. We're going to go there. I'm going to show you the first place that the word Nakash is ever mentioned. Okay. Chapter three, Genesis chapter three, verse number one says, Ha Nakash. Nakash, the serpent, was more cunning than any other beast. And what was the beast here? I told you life is called a Kai Kaya, right? But this is called a Kai. So he was living. I'm about to show you something. Do you guys see what I'm saying to you? I'm going to put the piece, I'm, I'm bringing the pieces together. The serpent was more cunning than any beast. A beast in Hebrew is called a kaya, okay? A kai, a kai. He's a kayath, okay? It means that he was a living beast. He's a creature, okay, of the field. That's the first time he's mentioned, okay? And this one wasn't Browns, but it was a serpent. It's a nakash. It's not hashatan. It's not Satan. It is a beast. So there was a beast that spoke to her. And he told her that she could eat of, he made a statement that did Yah say that you can eat? He didn't ask the question. He said, Yah said you can't eat of any tree. He just proposed a statement. He didn't ask a question like they said he did. He didn't ask a question. The grammar doesn't say he asked a question. He made a statement. What she did was she wanted to be wise. And so Yah told them, don't eat of this tree. If you eat, you're going to what? You're going to die, okay? If you die, did they die spiritually or physically? Spiritually. They die physically. Thank you, Akika. They died physically. Spiritually, they didn't die. They didn't die. Because if their spirit died, how were they able to live? I need you to hear what I'm saying to you. They lived, Right? They, the spirit gives you life. So they didn't die spiritually like they tell you in the New Testament. They're reversing it. They died physically. Okay. They died physically. What is the name of Eve? What's her name? What's her real name? Her real name is not Eve. Her real what? name is, huh? The name of the woman is, listen, the real name of her is called Kawa. Kawa. Okay, that's her name. He named her. He brought her to the man and he said, Adam, now this is the bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And he called the woman what? Isha, and he took out of a rib. Look, when was she called? Um, when was she called Kawa? When she had birth. Do you remember when he named her? Do you guys remember when he named her? Before I go on to that, I jumped ahead. What did Yah tell the woman about the snake? Let's read it. What did Yah tell the woman about the snake? Somebody tell me. What did he, what did he tell the woman about the snake? He told the woman that between you and a snake, I'm going to put some into me between you and a snake. Is when Yah had put judgment, verse 11 in Genesis chapter number three, he said, who told you 
that you were naked, right? And, right? Is who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree? This has to do with food, okay? Have you eaten from the tree from which I ordered you not to eat? That's physical. It's not spiritual. It's physical. The man replied, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree and I ate it. Physical, okay? Physical. And Yah said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman answered, the serpent. The Nakash tricked me. So I ate. Yahweh said to the serpent, the Nakash, because you have done this, not Satan, Nakash, since you have done this, you are cursed more than all the livestock on wild animals. So you got to ask yourself, why would Yah use the serpent if it's cursed? Why would Yah use the serpent? And he called and he cursed it. And he says, you're more cursed than all livestock. So you know that the animal, it was literally an animal. It wasn't Satan above all livestock and all wild animals. You're more cursed than all of them. So you got to ask yourself, well, why did Yah use these snakes as and put them up on a pole so a person can live? I'm about to show it to you. He says, you will crawl on your belly and eat dust as long as you live. I will put animosity between you and the woman and between your descendant and her descendant. You will bruise his head. I mean, he will bruise your head and you will bruise his what? You will bruise his heel. Okay. So the serpent is going to bruise the heel of her descendants. Okay. The serpent is going to bite her descendants on the heel. Okay. And he's going to crush its head. Okay. That's what he's going to do. He's going to crush his head. So why did God use the serpent as an image to put on a, on a pole to heal or to cause them to live? Does anybody want to know? Take a guess. Come on. What? Would you say, Kent? No, I said, of course, we want to know. I'm, I'm trying to figure it out. I'm thinking right now. So that okay. So here, let, let me, it was just a question, but let me, let me give it to you. Let me show you to you. We're going to go to second Kings chapter number 18. We're going to go to second Kings chapter number 18. Okay. Go to 2 Kings chapter number 18. We're talking about the brass serpent that they put on a pole. And I'm going to tie it up for us. It was in the third year of Hosea, the son of Eli, the king of Israel, that Kizzi Yahu, the son of Akaz, the king of Yehuda, began his reign. He was 25 years old when he began his reign. Oh, computers, boy. Kizzi Yahu, that's Hezekiah. He was 25 years old when he began his reign, okay? And he ruled for 29 years in Yerushalayim. His mother's name was Avi, the daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right from Yahweh's perspective, following the example everything David, his ancestor, had done. He removed the highs places and he, and he smashed the standing stones and he cut down the Asherah and he broke in pieces the bronze serpent. Yes. Forrest, you asked me the other day, you said, well, where are you going to make sure you talk about this? Because you said that you found out that Israel was snakes, snake charmers, and they worship devils. Yes, they did. Okay. And they worship snakes. He said he removed the high places. He smashed the standing stones. He cut down the Asherah poles. He broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moshe had made. Because in those days, the people of Israel were making offerings to it and called it Nakushtan. Israel worshiped the golden or the, the bronze serpent from the time of leaving the wilderness all the way to the time when Hezekiah Kizi Yahu destroyed it. Now, why would Yah tell us this in our Torah portion? Because that's what it's all about. I, I, I know I've taken you in different places. I know I mentioned several things. So let's put the puzzle together now. Okay. Let's make some sense of all this. Okay. The people of Israel has said that um, they despised Jah and they despised the bread that he gave them. That's why he used the snakes to attack them, okay? The snakes bit them, they got sick, okay? The man in Hebrew is called Enosh, and Enosh means to be sick. That's what Enosh means, okay? Enosh means to be sick. Man at, and at, his, at his, his core physically is a sick person, okay? He's sick. Man is a sick human being. F physically, he's sick. And of course, 
uh, spiritually as well and emotionally and all these different things, right? So right here, I got it up for you. It's called Enosh, okay? And it's called sick. Man is sick in a sense of mortality. Every human being will die, okay? And just by you being a man or a human being, or a woman is called, a man is called an Enosh in Hebrew, and a woman is called an Anashim, okay? She is the same as a man. She just has different body parts, but she's still a man. Because Job, when he made man, he made them both male and female. So the idea of a man, he's mortally sick. He's going to die, okay? When you think about this serpent biting these people and they became sick and they were dying. Remember, we looked at the pole and the pole represented to be sick. So the pole represents sickness. That's why they're using it with a, a serpent on a pole to represent medication, okay? That's why they're using it for medication. Um, this happened because the children of Israel detested what Yah had said, his words. That's why this came up upon them, okay? So when we look at the word nakash, I want to show you what that means. It is a noon, a ket, and a shin. And how do you spell it? N-A-C-H. Um, a S H Nakash. Okay. A Nakash is a means bronze. Okay. And but it also has the idea of divination. It has the idea to learn something through divination. Okay. And it means to be an enchanter, to to be someone who's learning through experience and all these sorts of things, right? So when we look at what Yah told him to make, he said, I need you to make a serpent. I need you to make a bronze serpent. Why bronze? Because bronze has to do with um, divination. Do you remember I read to you in Deuteronomy chapter number 18 today? The Yah says that you should not deal with me in any kind of way of divination or a soothsaver. Remember I told you to remember that word? Remember I told you to remember divination? Well, Yah is using the serpent. The serpent is used to be subtle and it is used because it sneaks up on you. Okay. And if you notice in the garden, the snake as it was a snake, the snake was cunning and it was deceptive. And he wanted to teach them something different than what the creator said. So let's put the pieces together. Israel complained against the Holy One of Israel, of Yah. They, play, they, uh, they went against him. They said that your words that you're giving us, this bread that you gave us, means absolutely nothing to us. Yah's words are represented by that manna. So what they did was they they... They threw Yah's words behind their back. They counted it for nothing. It meant nothing to them, okay? So because of that, he gives them the, the, the serpents, the fiery serpents, to judge them. Judgment is found in what happened because they said we sinned against Yah. That's why the New Testament uses Christ on the cross, okay? So it says, well, if you look to him, you'll, be, you'll, you'll live. This is, this is where they get that from, okay? But I'm going to show you why Yah gave it to us. Yah gave that Torah portion in reading to us and told us about this is simply because the children of Israel were into divination. Okay. They were into divination. And we have other texts and Ezekiel that says that they were worshiping other gods, that they worshiped and sacrificed to demons. They were doing all these different types of things. And we also know that Moshe said, when you get to this land, you should not be like the diviners. So we do know that Israel continued a, a form of divination because they were looking for answers. The communication that they wanted was different, okay? So if in 2 Kings, when we read that they had, they were still worshiping, as we saw in 2 Kings chapter 18, verse number four, that Hezekiah had to remove the brass serpent that Moshe had made. So they had this brass serpent all the way from the time that Hezekiah was in, um, in kingship all the way from Moshe. That was hundreds of years. So that testifies to the fact that Israel was still into what? They're into divination because they were seeking healing from this bronze serpent because that is the medical industry. That's how, instead of them looking to Yah to heal them, they were looking for medicine to heal them or looking for divination. In that case, they were looking, they probably did all kind of um, um, medications and, and, and mixtures of stuff. Divination means mixing stuff together and coming up with different compounds. So, 
I mentioned to you what life is. We know that these people are going to die. Your stomach is your life. Instead of us eating right, we're looking to medical for help. Medical industry is witchcraft and it's sorcery because what they do is they put different compounds together to trick the body to make it do things that it no normally doesn't supposed to do. And we look to the medical industry to help us survive. And we get this concept of it. It's a connection between the medical symbol that you have the pole and the snake is a direct relation to Christ on the cross. Because one, you will look to to heal you. So this concept of looking to something for healing comes from this idea of the snake being on the pole. The reason why Yah put the snake on the pole is because that was a form of judgment for divination. And Yah hated that they did that because you can see that right here because Hezekiah removed all the high places, smashed the standing stones, cut down the ash poles, and break in pieces the bronze serpent that Moshe made because in those days, the people of Israel were making offerings to it. They were making offerings to it. They were worshiping it. And, and they call it Nakushtan. And Nakushtan means the fiery serpent. So there were serpent worshipers. They were diviners. And they were looking for healing because the, the first time that they ever used it was in the wilderness. So they took what Yah made and turned around and made it into witchcraft, okay? JC on the cross is a picture of that. He's a picture of that serpent on the on that pole. But the thing about it is, you say, if I look to Christ, then I'm going to be healed, right? But you're not understanding that, that that particular thing that's on the cross is a serpent. You're looking to a serpent to heal you. That's why Yah gave it to Israel. That's why this is mentioned in this Torah portion, to warn the children of Israel. Because if he didn't want to warn us, he would have never told us here in, in the book of Judges that, and it means judgment, because that's what Judges mean. It means Shoptim. It means to judge. Yah wants us to understand that Hezekiah, when he tore these, this, this, uh, this serpent down that Moshe made, he was taking judgment upon it. He got rid of it. So if he got rid of it here, if he tore it down and he broke it into pieces, the bronze serpent, and this is supposed to reflect Christ of the New Testament, what is Yah telling us? He's telling us, do not look to the cross with this man on it, because you think you're going to get healed. You think you're going to have life, and that all it is is a serpent on a pole, and the serpent is cursed. The Christ is the serpent. Now, going back to the book of Genesis, where he was talking, and the serpent came upon them, he made a statement. And the first thing he says is, Yah says that you can't eat. Let me make the connection with you between the word of Yah and your stomach so you'll understand what everything is about. Everything that Yah has given us is about a land. Okay? In the land, you have fruits and vegetables, and you have wheat and barley, which will give you life. When the serpent told this woman that she had to eat something because in her desire to eat it was to make her wise because the serpent was there to use divination on her. She wanted to be wise like Yah. Well, why didn't she ask Yah what it meant? She didn't ask him. She did not ask Yah. She asked the serpent. She made a statement to him. She got in a conversation with him and he told her, Oh, if you eat this, ain't nothing going to happen to you. There's nothing going to happen to you. This has to do with our stomach. There's a connection between the medical industry and a, a connection between our food. Life for us is not this spiritual stuff that they're trying to teach us. Life for us is eating the right food. We don't want what Yah wants. When Yah says that I gave a land to your ancestors, I gave it to your ancestors so you can live in it, so you can eat the food of it. He tells us over and over and over and over and over again. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter number 34, he tells us, I'm going to bring you back to the soil. In 36, he tells you, I'm going to make your, your crops prosperous. When you get there, you're going to eat as much as you want. He told them that in the book of Deuteronomy, I'm giving you this, this, and this, and that. Food. The diseases of the nations won't be upon you because you're eating the right food. 
But just like in the garden, somebody came and they told you something other than what God says. The reason why people are dying today is because the food that they're eating. Why do y'all say I'm going to send you to exile? Because when you get there, you're going to get the diseases of the nations. Does this make sense to anybody? Does, do you understand that this is not this spiritual gyration of having the Holy Ghost, but this has to do with how you live your life and how you eat? Food is a biggest component of everything. Yes. If you don't eat right, you're going to die. When y'all wants to judge the nation of Israel, what does he do to them? He takes away their food. Why would he tell them when you get to the land, it's going to be full. The land's going to be full of iron. It's going to be full of copper. You're going to have the streams of water. You're going to have pomegranates, olives, all this kind of stuff. That's what he promised our fathers. And because of that, if we would live the way that he told us and we would eat the way that he told us, we would have life. How is the Torah connected to the food? Well, if you don't do what Yah says, he's cutting the water off, so it won't give uh, water and moisture to the land. And if there's no moisture in the land, you die because there's no food. Every time in the scriptures, in the holy scriptures, you find that when there's no famine, people die. When there's a famine, people die. Yah tells us over and over and over and over again. If we would do what he said, he would give rain in his season. I will give you the rain that you need. Leviticus chapter number 26 says this, so you can understand the connection. Yah says you are not to make any idols for yourselves, erect a carved image, a standing stone, or place anywhere in your land or bow down to it. What did we just read in 2 Kings? They took a pole with a serpent on it and bowed to it and worshipped it and made offerings to it. Keep my Shabbats and revere my sanctuary. I am Yahweh. If you live by my regulations, observe my mitzvah, which are my commandments, and obey them, then I will provide the rain you need. The connection is between the rain and the statutes and the regulations and the commandments, and you have to obey them. If Then I will provide the rain you need. You need rain, people. In its season, right now, in this land today, we've been having very little rain. And do you know, I bet a lot of you didn't notice if you live in California, we're in a drought. They're in a drought in Colorado. They're in a drought in Utah. They're in a drought everywhere. No one's talking about it. There has not been any rain. So there's going to be a famine. There's going to be a famine. There's not going to be enough food for people. Mark my words of what I'm telling you. Yah punishes people with famine. That's one of his great judgments. You could go to his, uh, as Ezekiel chapter number 14. It's one of his four sore great judgments. Famine, pestilence, uh, killing with the sword, and wild animals all day long. Okay? So... If you live by my regulations, observe my commandments and obey them, then I will provide the rain you need in its season. The land will yield its produce and the trees in the field will yield their fruit. Your threshing time will be extended to the grape harvest. Your grape harvesting will extend to the time of your sowing seed. You will eat as much food as you want and you will live secure in your land. That's salvation. I will give shalom in the land. You go to sleep and won't be afraid of anybody. I will rid the land of wild animals. Just Listen what he just said. When Yah's talking about, I'm going to give shalom, that means you're going to be whole. I just told you he had four sore great judgments. One of them is wild animals. So I'm going to get rid of the wild animals. I told you the other one was a sword. I told you the other one was a famine. And I told you the other one was pestilence. Yah says, if you do what I say, these things will not happen in your land. Period. It's about the food. It is about the land. In context, the serpent was only there for judgment because they spoke and said what Yah had said means nothing to us. We don't care about this bread that's coming down from heaven every single day. Yah has used that bread, that manna that he gave is what you and I are eating right now. 
called his words. He says, man shall not live by bread alone. He only used the manna to test them to see whether or not they would keep his commandments. If they would obey what he says. I want you to hear me and hear me well today. Everybody in Israel, if you're not reading your Torah and you're not reading out of Yah's word every single day, you are saying to Yah, his words are nothing to you. You cast his words behind you. You should be reading your Torah portion every single day. Every day you need to read from the word of Yah. Every day. Listen what I'm about to tell you. If you are going to have the attitude that our ancestors had, I'll read it again so you'll see. The people spoke against Yahweh. Numbers chapter number 21, verse 5. I'll read it again. I'll read it again. The people spoke against Elohim and against Moshe. Do you understand when he says they spoke against Elohim and Moshe? I'm telling you right now, if you and I despise anything that Moshe says, Yah says you despise me because I'm the one who told him this. The people despised Moshe. They spoke against him. Why do you bring us up out of Egypt? Why are you bringing us up for our, from our gods? Why are you bringing us up from the way that we want to worship? Why are all of a sudden now you telling us we got to do something differently? Yah brought them out to get their attention to test them, not to die in the desert. They said to die, but that wasn't the reason why we we're there. Yah was trying to see if they would do what he says, because if they did what he said, they would live. There is no food, no real food. Look how they said that about him. There's no roof, no real food. There's no water. No real food. No real food. We're sick of this miserable stuff. And that miserable stuff they're eating was Yah's words. The manna. What is it? You understand? So that's why Yah sent poisonous snakes to them. And that's why they bit the people on their, on their ankle. There's the connection to let you know why Yah wrote the story in the book of Genesis. He's telling you and I, if you and I don't listen to what he says, I'm going to judge you like I did your ancestors. How did he judge Adam and Kua? He judged them by letting them die. Don't you get it? If you don't do what Yah says, you're going to die because eventually you're not going to have any food. If y'all wants to get to us, he gets to us through food. The medical industry has now replaced y'all's food with medicine. Instead of you eating properly, you're taking nutritional protein shakes with all kinds of chemicals in it to hold your body together. You understand what I'm saying to you? This is why my mother died at 66 years old because of what she was eating. She had congestive heart failure because she refused to eat what Yah told us to eat. He given us a diet and said, you shouldn't eat this. You shouldn't eat this. You shouldn't eat this. You shouldn't eat that. But guess what? When you live in the Western culture, you listen to what these people are talking about and you listen to the beast and he'll tell you what to do. Hey, it ain't going to hurt you if you eat this. Isn't that what he told her? He told her that. Listen what he says. The serpent was more crafty and he, than any wild animal which Yahweh had made. He said to the woman, and it's not, did he, he's not asking her a question. This is an English translation, which is wrong. He just made the statement. He didn't ask a question. He just said, Yah said that you should eat from any tree of the garden. That's all he said. He didn't ask her no question. In English, this is a lie. There is no interrogative in the Hebrew. There's none. And I can show it to you just so you'll know that I'm telling you the truth because there is no punctuations in Hebrew. There, if you have to ask a question, you use words to ask questions in Hebrew. You don't use symbols. You ask, you use words, okay? So listen what he says. And I'll read it from right to left. And the serpent was cunning more than any beast of the field. It was a beast. And he said, he said, Yah, he says, he said, Yahweh Elohim, he said to the woman, Indeed, he said, Elohim, not shall you eat, okay? Not shall you eat of every tree of the garden. And they got a question mark right there in English. Guess what? If you want to ask a question, the question is ma in Hebrew, meaning 
who, me, or ma, meaning what. There is no interrogative. If you could look right here in the Bible hub, you will see there is absolutely no interrogatives. There's only pronouns, relative pronouns, verbs, nouns, but there is no interrogative. There is none. Interrogative means to ask a question. There's no question at all mentioned whatsoever. The reason why they want you to ask to say that he asked a question is to change you so you don't understand something, to get you off of what's really going on, okay? So there was never a question asked. He just made a statement, and that's how it happens. If he would have asked a question, that means he was making an inquiry. He's not making an inquiry. He's not asking her a question. He's not trying to get information out of her. He made a statement. Listen what he says. The woman answered the serpent, we may eat from the trees, the fruit of the trees of the garden. What? Yes, we can eat. It's about eating and it's about food. And But about the, the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, Elohim says, you shall not eat, eat from it or touch it or you'll die. Was that spiritual or was that physical? It was physical. It's physical. Because they didn't die immediately. We say, well, they died spiritually from the Christian perspective. No. Yah says, if you eat, eat a call. If you eat, if you put it in your mouth, you're going to die. It's poison. That's why the serpent is being used here because it makes you, he wanted to make them sick. So they could die. Oh, you better hear me right now. Look at the image of the medicine. It has a serpent on a pole, which reflects Christ on a cross to say, if you look to me, you'll be healed. That's why the medical industry doesn't work outside of having this image of this man on a cross. Because if you can believe the medical industry, and you can believe that what they could give you to heal you, then you certainly can believe. That's called divining. That's called witchcraft. Don't you see the witchcraft? He was trying to get her to be a diviner. Look at what he says. He was divining to her. He was giving her inside information. This is what a diviner is. A diviner is somebody telling you something that you don't know. I already showed you in the Hebrew. I already showed you what the word nakash means. Nakash, I'll bring it up again. Nakash means to divine. Nakash is a serpent. Nakash means to divine. It means to learn something through divination. <clears throat> That's why Yah put it on a pole. So you and I can always understand that what they're doing is using science and, 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 and witchcraft to come up with these compounds that which you and I will take like that COVID vaccine. Are you following what I'm saying to you? Listen to what the serpent said. The serpent said to the woman, you gotta put your phone on mute. The serpent said to the woman, it, it is not, is it not true? Is it not true that you will certainly die? The serpent said to the woman, it is not true that you will surely die. It is not true. That is a lie. He's saying, if you eat this, you ain't gonna die. If you, if you take this vaccine, you ain't gonna die. If you eat that pork, you ain't gonna die. If you eat that shellfish, you ain't gonna die. Because Elohim knows on the day that you eat of it, that your eyes will be open. He's giving her divination right there. She's looking for answers from him, from the beast, from the snake. Oh, you can take this medicine, you ain't gonna die. You're not gonna die. They're poisoning our food, yes. Be that's why we're in exile. That's why you and I are getting sick. When you're back at home in your land, he said, I will not bring these diseases on you because of the food you're gonna be eating is gonna allow you to live a long time. He said, my people's days will be like the days of a tree. That's life. Not this idea of eternal life of going to heaven. The reason why people are living the way that they're living right now is because they're looking to the damn snake. They're listening to this snake. 
when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, people, not spiritual, she saw it was for food. And it was pleasing in appearance to her eyes and that the tree was desirable for making her wise divination. She took some of its fruit and ate it. And then she gave it to her husband. By the way, this uh, English translation doesn't show you, but guess what? He wasn't just talking to her. He wasn't just talking to her. He was talking to both of them because he says the moment of you, and we think you means individual, but in the Hebrew, he's talking about Kim, meaning two of them. It was plural. That's a plural you, more than one, okay? So then they went on, they heard the voice of Yahweh in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And so the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Yahweh among the trees in the garden. Now, by the way, just to let you know, in Hebrew, the word tree is called eights. It's an ayin, a tzadi, um, and I mean, uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, ayin, a tzadi, yeah, adi and a tzadi, it's eights. And eights means tree, okay? And the same word that's used for eights for tree is the same word that has the same root to mean counsel, to counsel you, okay? So really, literally what this serpent was here for was to give her counsel. And he's trying to teach her divination. And he said, if you eat what I'm telling you to eat, you'll be all right. You don't worry about what Yah is saying. Throw what he says behind your back and, and take this. That's why these people didn't want to have anything to do with Yah's words because they said it was useless. Yahweh called to the man. He says, where are you? He answered, I heard the voice in the garden. I was afraid because I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? So he has, he had his eyes open and, and, you know, and have you eaten from the tree? If you notice, it's still about eating something. Have you eaten from the tree? Which I ordered you to, not to eat. Was that physical or spiritual? It was physical. The man replied, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit. So whatever it was, it was a fruit that he, that they ate that opened their eyes. Now, for, for those of you who are familiar with cannabis, you could tell me what does cannabis do, do for you? What does cannabis do for you? Cannabis will open your eyes. THC will open your eyes. Am I right? Will it increase your, your, your mind? Would it open your mind where you can start understanding things a lot better? Yes, it's used, okay? And don't get on me, oh, you're smoking weed. No, it's used, it's a, it's a natural herb. My point is, if there's a natural herb that you can ingest, if they didn't smoke it and they ate it, it would still have the same effect. So you can't tell me that there's something magical about this fruit. There could have been a fruit that he had that would help open up their, their eye, their third eye, so they would be able to see some things that they weren't supposed to see. And what they did not supposed to see was their nakedness, obviously. So he asked the question, did you eat it? Did you, have you eaten from the tree physically? And have you eaten? Have you taken counsel from someone? Yes. I ordered you not to eat it. It's about what Yahweh says. Then the man replied, the woman that you've given me to be with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree and I ate it. Okay. Yahweh Elohim said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman's answered the serpent, tricked me. So I ate again. She ate it. So then Yahweh said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than the livestock and wild animals. So that this is a cursed animal. You can find that in of course, Isaiah, again, this animal, this beast is cursed. So why did Yah use the serpent to put on, on, on there? Because he's letting you know you're cursed. It's a judgment. Because it has to do with divination. When divination, when the Christianity came and bit you and I on the ankle, you understand? It took a hold of us. And then you and I are supposed to look to Yah. Why did it happen? Because our ancestors rejected what Yah said. That's why they got bit. They got bit and they died physically. Not spiritually, physically. When you learn Christianity and you follow witchcraft and diviners and soothsayers and sorcerers and warlocks and witches, you are going to die. Because they're going to tell you that it's okay, like Peter said. Peter said he saw a vision with every animal that you can think of on it. And he said, everything is clean now. That's what Peter said. But did Yah say it? No, he didn't. But what did Yah said? He said, I will put animosity between you and a woman, between your descendant and her descendant. He will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. Here, this he he's talking about is Israel. The ones who overcome. The ones who overcome will bruise the serpent. They will crush his head. 
They would say, we're not getting into divination like our ancestors. We're not gonna worship the, the snake on the pole. So again, if the snake on the pole was what Israel worshiped and Hezekiah came and smashed it and broke it down because they were it was involved with divination. Then if, the, if they say, if Christ has said, um, if you lift me up like the serpent was lifted up, he's already letting you know that he's the serpent. And Yah doesn't, Yah didn't accept that as worship. That's why Yah gave it. And that's why Yah waited to tell us in Second Kings that he told Hezekiah to get rid of it because that's what his father Dawid would have done. Because Dawid was like Yah. He was like, hey, a man after my own heart. And it said, if you keep to continue to read, continue to read in Second Kings chapter 18, you will find that Hezekiah was more like David than any of David's sons. And so Yah condemns the pole with the snake. Do you understand? So if you're around worshiping the man hanging up on the pole, because remember now they don't want to cross now. Now that the Hebristians, because those are the people that I named, and if you ever heard of Hebristian, I'm the one who coined the phrase, you would understand the Yah has told us that he condemns the worship of anything on a pole or a stick. They know that it's no longer a cross. So now they switch it to, well, yeah, it wasn't a cross. It was a pole. And cursed is a person who's hung on a pole. Yes, you're right. It is a curse. You understand? So that's what, it's, that's what this teaching is about. That's exactly what this was about today. Okay? So Yah says, because you've done this, okay, to the woman, he said, I have greatly will increase your pain in childbirth. You will bring children in pain. Is that still happening today? Yes. You will bring four children in pain. And he had to deal with her bones, by the way. In Hebrew, it talks about this pain has to do with the expanding of her bones, her eights. Matter of fact, I forgot to tell you. Not only does eights mean tree, but eights, eight seen means bones. So God looks at a man like a tree, right? Our bones represent like a, a tree. Eights, eight seen, you can look it up, okay? So the same word that's used for tree is the same word used for bones. And so what he's telling her is, I'm going to cause some pain in your bone structure. And the reason I'm going to cause this pain in your bone structure, like your pelvis, I'm going to expand your pelvis in your lower back. I'm going to move your bones out of place, Okay. I'm going to put some pain in your bones for what you did. And the reason why he's going to do this is simply because she decided to listen. He's going to have something grow inside of her to bring pain to her, okay, to remind her, okay, all the pain that she's going to get in an expansion. Oh, my back hurt. My stomach's all the way out. I got this fruit. You're getting this fruit. Yeah, every time a woman gets pregnant, it's to remind her, okay, that she went against Yah. I never heard that before, have we? Never heard that the reminder for a woman is your pregnancy and your pain of your birth is to remind you that you went against Yah. You desire to be wiser than Yah. You, be, you wanted to be a diviner. You were, you, you were into divination. You wanted answers outside of what Yah said. So let me remind you, woman, for the rest of your life. See, so does Yah get rid of the pain of pregnancy? No. He, live, he leaves it there. You understand? Uh, he says, your desire will be towards your husband, but he will rule over you. That's one of the judgments, okay? So you're going to get pain in your bones. You're going to bring forth the child. But even in your pain, after you have the child, there's a great joy. So there's pain first, and then there's joy. Why is he telling this? Because Israel is going through great pain right now. But after Yah births us, we're going to come out. It's going to be great joy. The world is going through pain right now, okay? But we're going to have great joy when we're birthed. Your desire will be towards your husband, and he will rule over you. So in a lot of sense, what is Yah saying? Yah is our husband and we're the, like his woman. He's going to rule over us. A woman, her husband, she wants to rule over her husband. But guess what? You're not going to rule over your husband. That's a reminder to you that you disobey Yah. That's your reminder to the man. So ladies, um, um, Anashims, you guys don't get upset and don't be mad at Yah because of what he's done to you. Because what he's done to you is applicable. And you he chose your, your spirit to be the one to, to, to get that. For whatever reason, he wants to remind you. Now he's going to remind us what it is to go against him. Chapter, um, chapter number 3, verse 17. And to Adam, put your phone on mute. And to Adam, he said, because you've listened. Okay? Now, because you've listened to your wife. All right? Now, here's what's going to happen to you. Okay? And you ate. It's not only that you listen to her, that's not only the bad thing, but you also, because the reason why he listened to her was because the woman is supposed to be an Aza, right? She's an Azer. But a woman, when she, when Yah made her, he made her out of a bone. 
He made her out of the side of man, out of a rib. And that rib means to counsel. So she's supposed to have been a counselor to him. So instead of her counseling him for good, because remember, y'all said he shouldn't be alone. I should give him somebody that can help him and counsel him. So she's supposed to counsel him, but he took counsel from her, which means that her counsel was to go against the Holy One. And he says, because you took counsel from her by listening, not the counsel was bad, but you ate. You ate from the tree about which I gave you an order, a commandment, a zav, like a mitzvot. I gave you a zav. You are not to eat from it. Physical. The ground is cursed. So now I'm going to curse this ground. Okay on your account so he said oh that seems like she he got she got pain in her body now he's going to curse the ground well you know a woman is just like the ground you know you got the a right woman you got the good soil you put some good seed in it you'll get some good fruit okay but if you got a bad woman right and she doesn't do what she's supposed to she's bad soil you put the seed in it and it's nothing and it's nothing good, good it's not gonna come out of it you need good ground for good soil okay you need good seed to put in good soil Right. So, ladies, if you're listening, you don't want to pick a man who's bad, has a bad seed because you're going to plant it in you and that's going to come out and you're going to think that it's going to be good. But the whole time is it's still his seed It's still evil. It's still bad. And it's still not it's not going to do what you ask him to do. You might be good, but the seed might be bad. Like, vice versa, man, if you have good seed, why would you go out and find a woman who is bad seed? Why would you choose somebody who the ground is real dry, who can't do what you ask them to do, won't listen, won't produce any of the fruit, and you're constantly watering to it, but it just doesn't have the minerals that you need for it to, to put it for your seed, okay? So you will, so what he's saying is, I'm going to curse the ground because the ground is reflective to her womb, you understand, and because she brings forth, but guess what's going to happen with her? He says, you're going to work hard. You're going to work super hard. And what are you going to work hard with? You're going to work hard with your hands and your arms, which are what? Your etzim, your yadim, your bones. I'm going to make it like her bones and her body's going to hurt. I'm going to make your body hurt now. I'm going to give you pain by the hard work from you trying to dig and, and, and shovel out and work until this, this ground that just won't give anything that you need from it. I'm going to have you work it as long as you live. It will produ produce thorns and thistles for you. That's what you're going to get out of it. So you're going to plant seed. Nothing good is going to come out of it. You're going to be trying your best to bring some, some produce, and it's not going to happen. And then you will eat field plants. You understand? So is this is has Yah turned the curses of us to spiritual curses? Like, oh, this is your sin. Or did he put it back to how we live? He put it on how we eat. How do you survive? That's what he put it on. He put on, how are we going to survive? What are you eating? I'm going to have you eat field plants. Is, is he the only one eating field plants? No, she's eating field plants as well. You will eat bread by the sweat of your forehead. <laughs> you going to work for this. I'm gonna, you got to go through some pain to get a meal. I'm going to make you work for it. Now, you had it easy. Like he told Israel, I brought you to a land where you didn't do any of the vineyards, you didn't do any of the planting, you didn't do any of this. I gave you everything you need, but you didn't rejoice. So guess what I got to do? I'm going to throw you out the land. But before I do that, I'm going to stop letting it rain and ain't nothing going to happen. No produce is going to happen. I'm going to take away all, all your wine. I'm going to take away all your grain, all your barley, all that. I'm taking it all away, all your olive oil. There ain't going to be no more fruits. There ain't going to be nothing for you because you didn't listen to what I said. You understand? So here in 18, in Genesis chapter number three, he says it will produce thorns and thistles for you, which is reflective of what a woman, because it's the ground. These thorns and these thistles are the, 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 the children that will come out of you. <laughs> you go put it in here and these people are going to come out and what are the thorns and thistles? Things that hurt you, things that are tough, things that you got to get rid of. You're going to have some challenges now. You understand? This is metaphoric language in a sense, too, because he's telling us that you're going to bring, you're going to work hard, but you're not going to get nothing out of it. When you got to the land of exile that you're in, you're going to work hard, but you ain't going to get nothing out of it. You will eat bread by the sweat of your forehead and return to the ground, for out of it you were taken and you are dust and you will return to dust. Is that physical or spiritual? That is physical. Here's the thing. Verse number 20. After Yah has said this, the man named his wife. And we're going to close with this. The man named his wife. In verse number 20. And guess they call it Kawa. 
but let me tell her name is not Eve, just in case you didn't know, but I'm about to tell you what Kawa means. Kawa, Haluyawa. You hear that? Kawa, Haluyawa. Kawa, Haluyawa. He called his Ishto. Here it is. It's a, a ket, a wa, and a hey. It's called Kawa. C H A W A H. Kawa, like Yawa. Okay. Hear me? So the ka meaning, okay, division, right? So look at her name. Her name means life. That's what her name means. Kawa means life. I told you, what does the word nakash mean? Nakash means to divine. It's a diviner, okay? And it's a beast is a, a kaya. A life is a kaya. That's what Yah calls a beast, a serpent. Kaya, okay? So one life was telling another life how to get life. Do you understand that? The serpent was trying to tell her how she could live forever. He was trying to promise her something. And he said, if you, if you do this, you get to live forever. You could be like, yeah, you'll know the difference between good and evil. He doesn't want you to, to live. But guess what happened? When they didn't listen to what Yah said, they died. You understand? Does everyone understand what I'm saying to you? If you and I do not do what he says, you're going to die. The serpent was there. Why did, why did Adam call her life? He called her life because life means the stomach. Do you understand? It's in your stomach. The, the serpent knew that if she ate this poison, it would be passed on a generation and generation and generation. He knew that it would destroy their ability to live. He knew if he did this, it would destroy their ability to produce. Remember, he would, it, would, it would do this and it would be con consistent. He knew that the curse, because he was a diviner, he knew that the curse would uh, not allow the ground to bring forth any good thing. Adam was in a garden. That's where he was. He was in a garden with anything he could eat. Y'all said you could eat anything that you want to eat, but don't eat this because this will change your molecular structure. If you eat this, you're going to die. You understand? So what is Yah telling us here today? He's telling us if you and I would listen to Yah and we would eat, and it's just that simple, folks. If we would listen to Yah and eat what he says, we'll live. If, you, if he says don't eat pork because I'm going to kill people who eat pork, don't eat it. He's given us instructions what to do and what not to do. And if we do what he says, you get to live. And it's, and it's as simple as it is. It's food. That's what it is. That's why we're perishing. That's why we get old. That's why our muscle muscular structure wears down because we don't have the minerals that we need. We don't have the vitamins and the minerals in our food. They're making fake food. Everything is fake. You think those hamburgers and McDonald's are real? You think that's real beef? You think that the taco meat that you're eating at Taco Bell is real? You think the chickens that you're eating right now don't have any hormones or whatever? How are they able to produce all this food? You think the little nuggets that you eat are real? They're not real. The food's not real. The vegetables have been genetically modified. I hope you understand what I'm saying to you. They modified the vegetables and the fruits so they can get the production out of them faster because they know that the ground, because they don't give the ground any Shabbats. They don't give the land Shabbats. They don't let the land lay for, se uh, for uh, six years and seven years, and every seven years they let it rest. They don't do that because if they did that, it would stop their, their production was, it, and it stopped their money. You understand? So all this is talking about, and you would say, man, how'd you find all that in this verse, in, in chapter number 21, verse five? I found it because Yah saying, I want them to look at this poll because they're sick. They're sick because they said that what I, I judged them because they said that my words were worthless. They said that the bread that we're getting, this manna, this what that I gave them every day was nothing, which is equivalent to if you don't follow the Torah and you say, I don't want to read the Torah. I ain't going to read the Torah portion every day. Then you're, then you're, Yah says, you count my words for nothing. If you don't listen to Yah's words, you won't live. Yah says, if a man or a woman does what I say, they'll live by them. He's not talking about eternal life, people. He's talking about living a regular life with your family and having good things. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about if you do what I tell you to do, you'll live a long time in the land that I'm giving you. We're being killed right here because of the land, not only with 
uh, the people, but the food. Every every part of our existence in this in this land that we're in right now is designed to kill you, and that's your punishment. Yet when Yah punishes us, He literally means what He says. If He says that I'm going to punish you and you're not and you're not going to live, uh, you're going to die. He's not talking about your soul. He's talking about your body. And that's and that's a it, and we and we chose that. We chose to die. That's what we chose. Okay. But he says, if you do something, then you get to live. And one of the things he told us that if we would do what he asked us to do, then we would live. Okay. Here, listen what he says. And I'll, I'll close with this. He says, you are a people. And this is in um, Deuteronomy chapter number seven, verse six. Just, just listen carefully. It says, you are a people. He's talking to the whole nation of Israel. You are a people who are set apart for holy for Yahweh, your Elohim. That's what you are. You're a set apart people are holy. Okay. And I know a lot of us don't want to be holy and a lot of us don't want to be set apart. But if you're going to be walking with Yah, you're going to have to eat what he asks you to eat. You have to live the way he tells you to live. You're going to have to wear what he tells you to wear. Yahweh your Elohim has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his own unique treasure. And I don't know what, what's so terrible about this, but you know what's so terrible about this? That you don't get to be who you want to be anymore. You don't get to live the way you want to live anymore. You don't get to talk the way you want to talk anymore. If you're going to really be a special treasure to Yah, you're going to be set apart. And one of the things that you're going to do, and you have to understand, is this. When Yah gives us a command, you're going to have to follow it. But you know why our people won't follow Yah? Because they don't want the lamb. I have so many people in my family, so many people that are my friends and, and everything, that they want heaven. They don't want the lamb. They don't want fruits, vegetables. They don't want to go in the vineyards. They don't want olive oil. They don't want any of that. None of that stuff means anything. They can get all that down to Safeway and Costco. So what, what's that big deal? What's the big deal? They don't want it. So he says, he says, Yahweh did not set his heart on you or choose you because you numbered more than any other people. On the contrary, you were the fewest of all people. Rather, it was because Yahweh loved you. So if you're waiting for the New Testament to find out that Yah loved you, you're wrong. You're mistaken. Here, chapter number seven, verse number eight in Deuteronomy, Davarim, he says, rather, it's because Yahweh had loved you and because he wanted to keep his oath, which he swore to your ancestors. And the oath that he swore to our ancestors were that he was going to give them a land and to them and their descendants to make them wealthy. And it says, and that Yahweh brought you out with a strong hand and he redeemed you from a life of slavery. That's what Yahweh redeemed us from. And under the hand of the king of uh, Pharaoh, the king, he says, for this, you can now know, okay, you can know that Yahweh, your Elohim is indeed Elohim by what he did by delivering us out of Mitzrayim. That should let you know that Yah is a faithful Elohim. That should let you know that he, he keeps his covenant and extends his grace to those who love him. Yah gives grace to those who love him. He doesn't give his grace to those who disobey him and those who obey his commandments to a thousand generations. So if you and I think that, you know, the, the, test, the Old Testament is done away with, you're mistaken. Yah's love towards us is for those who observe his mitzvot and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Okay? We're not past a thousand generations. He repays those who hate him to their face and he destroys them. So if you're hearing this message today, I'm telling you, he's going to destroy you if you hate him and he's going to repay you to your face. You hate him by disregarding his, his testimonies and his commandments and his, um, his laws and statutes, his appointed times. He will not be slow to deal with someone who hates him, but he's going to repay them to their face. Now he says, therefore, you are to keep his commandments, his laws and his rulings that I'm giving you today to obey them because, let me tell you the reason why, because you because you're listening to these rulings and you're keeping it and you're obeying them Yahweh your Elohim will keep with you covenant and mercy that he swore to your ancestors if you do what Yah says Yah says because you're listening to these things and keeping them and obeying them Yahweh will keep with you covenant and mercy that he swore to your ancestors so the mercy is, is when I come to judge the world, if you've done what I said, I'll spare you. I'll have mercy on you. I'll, have, I'll show you compassion. And guess what? 13 says this, he will love you and bless you. Why? Because you're keeping his commandments. He will bless you and increase your numbers. We want Yah to bless us and increase our numbers, but we don't do what he says. We, and when increasing your numbers don't mean your numbers in the bank account. Your numbers mean your children. He will bless the fruit of your body and the fruit of your ground. In, the, in your grain, in your wine, in your olive oil, and the young of your cattle and your sheep in the land he swore to your answers to give to you. He will bless you more than all other peoples. There will not be a sterile male or female among you, the same with your livestock. 
Okay. Why? Because you're eating what Yah told you to eat and Yah will remove all illness from you. He will not afflict you with any of the Egyptians, the Egypt's dreadful diseases, which you have known, which you have known. Instead, he will lay these on those who hate you. Okay. And listen, this is the bottom line. That's what Yah wants to do for you. He will increase our numbers and he will increase our land and he will increase our fruit. He will increase the fruit of your body, the fruit of your land and the fruit of your animals. But the people don't want that. They want heaven and they want wings. And that's what they want. They're not after the fruit and the vegetables. They are not interested in the land. And because they're not interested in the land, and this is the cold part, because they're not interested in the land, that means they're not interested in the covenant because the covenant has to do with the land. And if you don't obey the covenant and you don't obey the laws and the statutes and commandments, you're not going to the land. You're not going to the land. I hope you understand that. Does anyone have any questions, concerns, additions, subtractions, or contributions? I want to hear from you right now. When they Shalom. Say, uh, uh, the Kushtan, does that have anything to do with Kush? Or, yeah, does that have anything? Because I know no. it's the Kushtan. Nothing. Huh? No, no. No, no. It's just like you had asked me. Hey, are they are they are they devil worshippers? Are they are they are they snake worshippers? You said you found some some um, are, some information on them how they were serving snakes and how they were worship snakes, and you said, oh, man, that sounds crazy. And I was, and I told you, yeah, they did. They did serve snakes. Um, they they believe when they look towards the um, that that snake and that pole, they would look that they would have life. They were divining. <laughs> So they took what Yah had made, but Yah gave it to them to, to let us know, okay? He gave it to them at that point in the wilderness as a judgment, right? Put the snakes on them. Then he relieves the punishment with the same image. First, he gives the reality to them. Then he takes an image of it, and he puts the image on a pole, okay? So what it is is that it's an image. But you ask yourself, well, didn't Yah tell them not to make any images? So it seems like Yah's contradicting himself, right? Yah's telling Israel, don't make any images. You don't make any images. He told Moshe to make this image, right? So what they did is they took what, what he did and turned around and used it for divination because they're, they've always been a people who is interested in divination. That's all they've ever wanted to do. And so someone is, they will give them life. So they're looking to the snake to answer the questions. People that look to Christ as hanging on a pole are looking for someone to answer the questions. They're looking for some life through that. And Yah, that's not Yah's way of giving us life. And so they use the snake um, image to say, well, that was a that was a um, that was a, a, a hidden mystery. That was a, a prototype of Christ in the in the wilderness. That was a prototype. And so if it is a prototype, then why did Yah destroy it in 2 Kings 18? Yah destroyed it because it's idolatry. And Yah's letting Israel know that this is idolatry. That's idolatry. Okay. He didn't, he didn't create it for it to be, he created it for judgment. And for those who would gaze upon it, he wanted them to see what it meant for them. They had to look to what Yah had put up there to remind them of what they've done and what they said. The whole purpose of judging them and bringing them, putting the image of that, that, that brass serpent was for them to remember, well, you know, I just got bit by this brass serpent and a lot of people died. And so why did, and why did it happen? It's always like, what's the reason why? The reason why is because they spoke against the manna, which is Yah's words. They spoke against what Yah was given. They said it was worthless. And so in that case, Yah has given this to us to teach you and I, because we're their descendants, that number one, do not speak against me and do not speak against Moshe. That's number one. Do not speak against us because he's my servant and I gave him to you because you asked me to. And plus I sent him. I chose him, but you're the one who also chose him too. So it's not like one, one deal. Like I chose him and that's it. You chose him. I actually chose him to bring you to me so I could talk to all of you, but all of you didn't want to hear what I had to say. So you chose him. And because you did that, Yah says, okay, that's good because I would kill all of them. And if it wasn't for Moshe interceding on our behalf, we would have been dead a long time ago. 
Okay. So this is the importance of us understanding what the Torah represents. The Torah is Yah's words. It's his voice. So when he speaks to us, he's talking to us about what his intentions are. He's giving us the heads up on the Nakash. That's why he mentions it in the book of Kings. He tells that prophet, uh, which is Shemuel, I need you to write this to remind the children of Israel that it's an image that I had to get rid of. I had to get rid of this. Excuse me. I said Shemuel wrong. That's judge. Uh, that's that's judges. It's not kings. So I give in this to you so you can remind the children of Israel that someone's going to come and try to get you to worship something. Okay. So it's two things that are going on. You're worshiping medical, which is the, the image that I showed you. Do you remember the image that I showed you? You're worshiping the image of medical. You're looking at medicine to heal you. You're looking, instead of you doing what I say, okay, and you're casting my words behind you, you got to look to this image now. This is what you're looking to. You. This is what people are looking to. They're not looking at Yah anymore. They're looking at this. You, you see? And because, so it's more like a, like a test? Yes, it is a test. It's a test because what, if you would do what I said, then that would have never happened. See, that, remember the pole represents being sick. This pole is called what? A nace, okay? It was a noon and a samak, okay? And it means, and it means to, you know, a banner to be lifted up so that it's obvious. Remember, it means conspicuous, to be seen. So he says, okay, but the altar, nasas, means to be sick. It means to be sick, okay? So when the snake bit them, and if you notice, that's the reason why they're using it, because it means sickness, Okay, it means to be ill. Okay, and this and they and they think that the snake, right? The snake is what you would call if you look at the snake. The pole was used to hold the image of the the brass and snake. Okay, but the snake right here in Hebrew, nakash. The nakash means what? Nakash means to divine. It means to be a divination. Okay like the serpent that was in the garden. It means the divine, it's a diviner, okay? That's why in the book of 2 Kings, they were what? They were looking at this. They were worshiping this because they were divining. They were trying to get answers. That's why I brought you over to the book of Deuteronomy chapter number 18. It told us, don't be like the nations. Don't look to look for divining. Don't do no divination. Don't be a diviner. Don't do this. No, no, no. Don't do this. So if this snake right here represents divination, then you know that all over the top, the doctors are putting together different recipes. They're using, they're using what they call, um, uh, you know how witchcraft and they put potions together? That's what they're doing. That's what they're doing. They're mixing things together to get to make your body do certain things, which it shouldn't be doing. And they think that they're healing you by doing these things. But these things right here are the things that are killing you. You understand? Like, for example, I, I use Motrin for like, when I got out of the hospital, I've been on Motrin for like nine months. And I was taking 18, 1,800 milligrams a day. You understand? Close to it, I think, yeah. 1,800 milligrams a day. And they were like, and then I, I was on Tylenol. I was like, hey, they said like, Tylenol is bad for your liver. So I stopped taking Tylenol. Then I went to Motrin because of the pain, right? So I went to the pain. I was like, well, I'll do the Motrin. And then I'll just, you know, then I start cutting my Motrin down, you know, to from 1800 to 1200. And then I went to, then I went to 600. And now I haven't taken a Motrin in the last, about a week. I haven't taken the last week. Why? Because I replaced it with something natural. I've taken the CBD oil. I've taken CBDs from a plant. That's what I'm taking. I'm just testifying to you. You understand? Okay. So to divine something means you're looking for answers. So what I'm saying to you is, is that when you look to this, the medical to, to be your divination, to give you the answers you're looking for to solve your problems. My mother died at 66 because instead of I said, mama, you need to eat right. She says, no, I'm going to do what my doctor says. Period. Therefore, my mother remains sick as a, like the, in the word for enosh or man or woman in uh, Anashem means to be sick, mortally sick. 
Because in the garden, we were told you're going to die. So the moment that we ate that, they changed our molecular structure. Everybody born after that goes through the same process of death. So the only way that yet is by what we ate that killed us. The only thing that can bring us back to life is how what we eat. But Yah says, man should not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of my mouth. And so what the connection between what Yah is saying is, if you were to do what I tell you, you get to live longer. And I bring you back to the land. You're going to eat from the fruit and the trees and stuff that I gave you. But the only way you can get that food is if you obey me, because if you don't obey me, then the rain's not going to come. You'll change the, you'll change the, the, um, the seasons by your, I read, to, read that to you in Jeremiah chapter number five. He says, you change the, the uh, nature's rules by your disobedience. The, the rain didn't come when it's supposed to because you disobeyed me. So why did the snake in the garden and that same Nakash that's on this pole, the first time it's mentioned is in Genesis chapter number three. What did he get her to do? What did he talk her into? He talked her into eating something. That's what he did. Yah said, don't eat this. They're in a garden. Do not eat. So what, what is killing us is what we're eating. The reason why I said don't eat a pig is not because it's just detestable, because there's something in it that causes you death. So if you listen to him, you get to live because you're eating the right stuff. He uses eating um, and famine for plague. If you don't do what I tell you, I'll bring a famine on you, a plague. You won't have no food. You'll die. And based alone off the word alone for life is Kai. It's the ket in the yod. It's Kai. Kai. Life. This is life. Okay. And in Kai, life is your stomach. Life is your stomach. This is stomach. I showed it to you already. It's your stomach. And if your stomach's empty, it's like you're dying. You're like you're dead. My mother didn't eat 12 days before she died. She said, I'm not hungry. Didn't know that. I didn't know. Well, dang, maybe she's got, she died. Before you die, an animal stops eating. Before a human being dies, he stops eating. That's a signal to let you know life is about to leave. There's no desire to live. So if you eat the right stuff, if you put the right stuff in your stomach, the food that you eat, you get to live. It's the food. Do you understand? You're right. Absolutely right. Okay. So the Genesis, when the when the when Hashatan, this snake right here, because that's what it is, it's not, it's not is a Nakash, when not Hashatan, when Nakash, the serpent, told her to eat something, it poisoned them in their bodies, their molecular structure got changed. And they stopped going, living from like as long as they could. To, he lived 930 years. But over time, because when he says the land is not going to bring forth the fruit into you, you're going to get thorns and thistles. He's, he wasn't able to eat right. So then they started what? Their years started going down. If you notice in the book of Genesis, it talks about he was 930 years. He was 930. He died at 800 this. He died at this and this and that. And the death just keeps going down for 500. Oh, he was 600. Went down to 295. Then 150. Then all of a sudden 120. Moshe, you understand? That's how it happens. Sarah lived to 137 years old. I think Abraham was 150 something years old. You understand? So you only get to eat and live this long when you eat things, when you eat the right kind of food, because your kai is your stomach. It's how you live and what you eat. He, the serpent wanted her, this beast wanted her to eat, and why did Yah said you go on your belly? You go on your belly, and what are you going to eat? You're going to eat dust every day of your life. And what is man made from? Man is made from the dust. You understand? He's going to eat dust all the days of his life because he defiled that which came out of the dust, which is man. So because of what you've done to the dust that I that I took and made onto a man, I'm going to have you eat dust. And it says it in Isaiah. He says, everything animal, the lions are going to eat straw, the, the, the wolves are going to lay down with the, the lamb, and the serpent is going to eat dust. Everything that I'm telling you right now has to do with the land. And it has to do with trees and it has to do with food. That's what Yah promised us, land. 
This is our inheritance. Our inheritance is land, but what makes the land so precious and what makes the land so viable, what makes it so good and, and why he says it's a beautiful land of all lands in Ezekiel is because Yah is Yah's land. And it's the perfect land to allow people to live a long time. And it says that this land will become like the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Eden. Remember, the, he says the nations are going to say, man, this looks like the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Eden, Garden of Eden. It's going to look like Garden of Eden with what? Fruits and vegetables and beautiful stuff. So he's going to reinstitute bringing life to us again through the food. He knew when he sent us over here that we would not have the right food. He knew that this land is filthy and you would get food that would kill you. That's why he says, I want to destroy you because I'm going to send you somewhere where you're going to eat their food and you're going to die. You're going to die when you get here. You're going to die. He says, you know, count your days, learn how to number them. So what do you, what, here's the thing. What can you and I do right now? And I'm way over the time. Forgive me, you guys. You don't have to stay if you don't want. What would Yah give us at this time? How can we help ourselves? Because you're, you know, that way you're telling me about the land and we don't have a land. We don't have any, we can't plant anything. What I'm going to tell you is this. The number one thing that he tells us to remember the Torah of Moshe. We can remember that. We can remember his instructions. What we did was we enjoyed the land when we were in it. We loved the land when we were in it because it gave us what we wanted. We loved it. Okay. But we never thanked Yah for it. The, way, the reason why the land was blessed was because everything that Yah said, he gave rain to it in the season. He, he, made, he kept the soil. The, the Shabbats help keep the, the soil fertile. She's not being worn out. You got to give her time to rest. You understand? She needs rest. It's like a woman can't keep having babies without giving her body time to heal. So you have to keep giving it rest. Okay. You can't keep plowing. You got to give the, the land rest. Okay. You can't keep doing that to it. She can't take it. So you give her the rest that she needs, right? So what can you and I do right now? We can eat right. You can eat food as best as you possibly can. You can follow the, the, the dietary laws of the Torah. You can stop. You can cut the pork out of your diet. You can eat, don't eat no shellfish because those things are, are bad. They're an abomination because they hurt you. Like Yah told Adam in the garden, this will hurt you. This will kill you. Don't eat it. So that's the reason why that story is there, to let us know what happens. He's connecting death to food. That's what I'm trying to tell you, okay? What else can we do? Well, we know that Yah says, if you do what I tell you, you follow my orders, you'll live. So the primary thing that you and I need to do is do what he says. If you follow his instructions, according to the Torah, you'll live. That's a promise that he made in the book of Ezekiel. That's a promise he made in, that Moshe told us. That's where they got it from. It's because Yah told them to tell the children of Israel, if you do what I tell you, you get to live. If you don't do what I'm telling you, surely I, I tell you today that you're going to die. You understand? That's as easy as it gets, just like in the garden. You eat this, you die. You can eat anything else you want, but don't eat this because it's going to kill you. That's how simple it was. It wasn't a spiritual thing. They turned it. He did, he did some divination on her, okay? And what she ate brought upon something upon them. Their eyes were open, but the cost of having your eyes open and the cost of that knowledge to know of your nakedness and to try to be like Elohim, the Kelohim, because that's what it's called, Kelohim, to try to be like Yah, that's your, where you make your mistake. We make our mistakes when we try to be like Yah. That's what he's telling us. You're going to die when you try to be like me. Because instead of you doing what I said, you're trying to come up with what you think and what you believe. I didn't ask you to think and I didn't ask you to believe. I asked you to do what I told you to do. That's what I asked you to do. Okay. So we have to cut back. If you and I would eat right, you and I would no longer have to depend on this, the medical. If we would go out and walk, we would not have to worry about that. If you and I would cut back on our portions where we eat, we wouldn't have to worry about that. If we were taking the, the right herbs, we wouldn't have to worry about that. If we were thinking of, and monitoring the mineral intake that we had, we wouldn't worry about that. If we were drinking the water that we need to, you wouldn't be worried about this. My wife works in the medical industry. She'll tell you right now, Avi Yah is in the medical industry with the physical therapy. I mean, um, uh, uh, massage therapy, same thing. 
you don't take care of your body, you're going to be in a problem. So stop discounting your body and start listening to what the creator's talking about. That's what's so beautiful about this lesson today, because you would never be able to get this if you read it from a religious perspective. It's not about religion. It's about your body and it's about what you eat and it's about what you say and it's about how you, if you listen to what the creator says. So now today you have the Genesis enigma solved. When he talks about this, this, this serpent is going to be, it's going to hit you on the, on the ankle. What he's saying is he's going to cause you to what? Be sick. When you get bit by a snake, it puts poison and you die. Yah's telling us if you look to a snake on a pole, right? As your diviner, you're dead. If you look to any man on a pole, you're dead. You're dead because it's an abomination. Instead of you seeking answers from Yah, you believe that this man is going to give you life, which is Christ. You're going to die because you're listening to his words. You're, you're using him as a medium between him and Yah or whatever spirit world you want to go to. Yah says, the only thing that you need to hear is what I said. And the only thing that I said is what I said to Moshe and my prophets. And if you want to verify that they're a true prophet, look at what they said and see if it came true or not. That's how simple this is. Any questions? Because that's what this is about. This is about food. Hi, I have a quick question. Um, I was wondering if if there is any type of correlation between the, the staff that Mo, uh, Moshe had, um, uh, I know when he went before um, the Pharaoh, um, the staff turned into a serpent. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. I was just wondering if there was any type of correlation with that, or I was just wondering about that. Yeah, well, this here is called a Nas, right? Right. And Anas is different from a staff, okay? Okay, Anas is just a pole, right? A staff is generally like, you know, has a hook on it, which you do the shepherding. So when Yat, because that's the Lamed in Hebrew, right? So the Lamed is a staff, okay? And a staff is used for um, bond, you know, to put a yoke on someone or to guide or to lead, okay? Here, this pole is being used to identify, to be conspicuous, to lift up. Because this pole, so this snake wasn't like just wrapped around at the same height as this. It was put up on it, but the pole was lifted higher. Remember I told you at the beginning, a nas is a pole. And then on top of the pole, when the people would go to war, they would take this pole and they would put a banner or something on top of it. Like, um, I, I hope I can't, I don't know if I can, I'm trying to, I'm trying to draw with a finger. <laughs> You know, when those people are, you've ever watched Game of Thrones and in Game, in Game of Thrones, they have this, uh, they got, they got this uh, banner that they're walking around and they got the, their flag with their, with their image on it. And they're, and, they, and they're lifting up real high so someone can look at it and say that they're coming. So Yah is saying that this pole right here is a nos, it's supposed to be lifted up. It's supposed, it's, it's supposed to be lifted up, put up to a place where this is up high. So the snake probably went halfway about right here. And then the rest is the pole, right? And then the snake is wrapped around, you know. So when they looked at it, you'd be like, oh, okay, right? So no, there's no correlation beside that. That was a good point, though. So when he did, he threw his staff down and it became a snake because the magicians were into divination. That's what they did. They threw their staffs down and they became snakes. And so Yah told him to put his staff down and it became a snake and ate up all their snakes. So that's a good well wow what it, there there is there is something to be said right there meaning like for example divination when they did that israel now you know where they got it from so israel has always been into worshiping things like pharaoh and them they were they were worshiping snakes you know if you notice on a lot of their hats and stuff they got the cobra israel was into that they're into that stuff that's they've always been into that so for them you know that's just another god for them and so when they when they looked at it, they said, "Oh, this is, this is this is us being healed by this snake," and they, you know, the, the, even see they thought Yahweh was a, a multiple god. That's what they thought, and that's that's given or shown in when they made the golden calf. They said, "Oh, look at our gods. These are the gods who brought us out." So they believed in multiple gods, and a snake is just another god for them. Okay, the, one of the assortments that they can choose from. 
So in Egypt, they have the cobra, you know, they have the cobra. And the cobra that they had, when he threw his stake, when he threw his staff down, it ate theirs, meaning that Yah is the Elohim of Elohims. He's getting rid of divination, you know. So that's it. That's basically the only correlation I can make between the two. But that's an excellent point. Excellent. Anyone else? That was great. Anyone else want to add something or ask a question? And I'll try to give you my best answer. Anyone? Okay. All right. So let me close this down right quick. All right. Well, I thank you guys today for spending time learning about this. Hopefully you guys got something out of it. Um, Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, the King of the world, who's forming the lights and creating darkness, making peace and creating all things. Thank you guys for coming today and uh, learning about this. Um, I do appreciate your time. I know I went way over today, but it was a lot of information. But uh, it's important for you to understand that if you read your Torah portion, don't forget to read your Torah portion. Do not forget. Because if you, if you neglect it, now if you just accidentally forgot it, not a worry. Don't, don't be like, oh, I forgot, I'm in trouble. No. But if you're on a daily basis, read your Torah portion. And so Yah can start talking to you because that's how he talks to us. He talks to us through his words. The words that Moshe wrote are the words that Yah told him to write to us. So these words were written for you and I because he knew we would be in exile. He knew we would be here. And so he wrote them for us. And if you want to eat a little bit, then eat a little bit. If you want a little bit more, eat a little bit more, just like you pick it up on a daily thing. Okay. So praise be to the Holy One of Israel for you today. And may he continue to be with you and to, you know, show you his words and understand that, you know, this is deeper than just the spiritual, you know, that you and I been taught by these people it's really about what we're eating and it's really physical because you can't have the physical without the spiritual and you can't have the spiritual without the physical you know we don't we're not in a chasing ghosts and talking to ghosts because y'all says don't be in spell casters and ghost chasers and all that kind of stuff we don't do that we deal that which is physical that that has the spiritual component you know you can't a body can't be alive without a spirit or a soul right can't you can't a soul can't be outside of itself Yah puts a body on it. He always puts a body on something in order for it to be manifested. And so Yah reveals himself through manifestation. And he does manifestation through the things that he's made. And so are these things Yah? No, they're, they're the work of his hands. So today on Shabbat, when you look outside or you go walking or, or whatnot, you know, praise him um, for all that he's done. Praise him for the, for the food that, that we do have, you know, and make better choices in your food. You know, make better choices in what you eat. Um, eat some fruits, eat some vegetables, eat more fruits and vegetables. Put that more, make that more about your um, your diet. Make your diet more about fruits and vegetables, the thing that you know that Yah has made and get away from artificial things because they have chemicals in them that can hurt you. You know, um, medications, you know, um, if you're in pain, look at some other options, you know, get a massage, do ice packs, um, do exercises, do stretching, find other alternatives besides using medications, because like, you know, medications can get you hooked on drugs and all kinds of stuff. You know, when I came out of my surgery, they were like, hey, do you want some more nar narcos? I was like, no, I don't want that. And they're like, are you sure? I was like, yeah, I'm positive. I don't want narcos. I don't want to get on that stuff. I had to take it while I was there, but then after I came off of it, you know, but when we're in our land, God says, you won't have any diseases. You won't have any of these things going on. That's how powerful it is to, to do what he says. And if you and I do what he says, He'll bring you back home and you'll go back and get to your inheritance and you get to continue to live through yourself and your children and your children to have children and your children will have children. And that's how we get to continue to live. That's the life cycle. Everything has a, a, a start date and everything has an end date. And we need to be okay with that. The true essence of our creator is he, he's not bound to let us live forever because we believe that. If he wants to let us live to 100 years, or he says the days of my people will be like a days of a tree. If he says you get to live for 400 years, then praise be to the Holy One of Israel. Whatever he says. 
but you and I are responsible for what we eat. He's not the one putting it in our mouths. We are. So take responsibility for your life, your kai, which is your stomach. That's your life, according to Hebrew, our culture. Okay. And with that, I say shalom to you and I say shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Thank you for the lesson. Yes, thank you so much. You're welcome. You guys have a good one, okay? You too. Thank you. All righty. Shalom. Shalom. shalom.